we're live. Okay. Members, I would like to advise you that our meeting is now live and being broadcast through the Assembly website as it is uh, every um, week now. Um, so we have currently got five members on the meeting. We have got myself, Emma Shear, the chair. We've got Mike Nesbitt, the vice chair. We've got Paula Bradshaw, Michelle McElveen, Carl McCullen, and I can see that Mark Durkin has just joined us. So the first oh, yeah. this afternoon, you're all right, is <laughs> apologies. We haven't received any formal apologies, but we um, don't yet have customers. So he may join us later on in the meeting, and at that time we'll, we'll welcome him in. So members, if we want to move to the second item on our agenda, we have got a briefing um, this afternoon. We've got three briefings this afternoon, but the first is from um, the Equality Commission of the North, and we've got Geraldine McGahan on the line, I believe. I don't know if it's my... Yeah. into the spotlight yeah yeah hi good afternoon everybody can you hear me okay we can indeed yeah Geraldine, thank you okay. very much uh well it's great to see you all yeah no problem we're um just want to say thank you very much for the invitation to come along and talk to you today albeit that it is remotely uh, it would be lovely to do it face to face, but unfortunately, circumstances are what they are. But regardless, um, thank you on behalf of the Commission for the opportunity to update the committee on our views on the Northern Ireland Bill of Rights. I have to say that we welcome the opportunity to do so, as I've said, and we do wish you well in your consideration and deliberations in this very important work. The focus of our submission to the committee and our evidence today is on how a Northern Ireland Bill of Rights could help promote equality of opportunity and actually strengthen equality protections for people in Northern Ireland. I would like to start by highlighting a few general points and then set out some specific recommendations that we wish to see incorporated in a Bill of Rights. I want to make it clear at the outset that the Equality Commission does support the adoption of a strong and inclusive Bill of Rights reflecting the particular circumstances here in Northern Ireland. A Bill of Rights would provide an opportunity to make a clear statement of society's commitment to certain values, and it would provide a legal framework for ensuring that those values are advanced by all of society's institutions. It also has the potential to be an important opportunity to strengthen the human rights protection afforded to the most vulnerable and the marginalised people in our society, and to increase protection where existing law is perhaps inadequate. A Bill of Rights could also play an important role in underpinning the peace, prosperity and political progress of Northern Ireland. And if a Bill of Rights is introduced, it is critical that any steps taken in the wider UK context should not undermine or diminish those protections. It's essential that there should be a policy of non-regression from the current levels of protection under the Human Rights Act 1998 and any other ratified human rights instruments. In addition, any provisions within the Bill of Rights relating to equality and good relations, they must not weaken existing levels of protection currently under um, ex current equality legislation. In terms of some of the specific recommendations that we make on what should be included in the Bill of Rights, I would wish to draw the committee's attention in particular to one of our main recommendations, and that is that it includes the principle of equality. Members will be well aware that the general principle of equality is a fundamental element of international human rights law. The inclusion of such a principle could, for example, provide the framework for more specific anti-discrimination legislation, which can spell out in detail the matrix of legal rights and duties necessary to give effect to the principle of equality. And it could therefore underpin Northern Ireland's equality legislation, which provides detail in terms of respect to be called rights and responsibilities. And moreover, it could also be used as an interpretive principle to which the courts and public authorities must have regard. Including the principle of equality in a Northern Ireland Bill of Rights would indeed be a recognition of the importance and centrality of rights and equality protections in the Belfast Friday Agreement. 
In addition it, to including an equality principle in the Bill of Rights, I want to stress that there are other key measures that the Executive Assembly could take to underpin such a principle. In particular, measures to strengthen Northern Ireland equality laws and address gaps in our equality legislation. And although we support the adoption of a Bill of Rights, we would ask the committee to note the significant contribution that updated and strengthened equality legislation could ha also have in enhancing the protection of human rights in Northern Ireland. And members will already be well aware that there are significant gaps between equality law in Great Britain and Northern Ireland, including gaps in relation to the obligations placed on public bodies not to discriminate under anti-discrimination legislation. Further, we would recommend that the committee gives consideration as to how best to ensure that the international human rights standards set out in a range of international human rights conventions are reflected in the Bill of Rights and or underpinning the legislation. <clears throat> this would include specific reference to the particular instrument which sets standards in the areas of civil and political rights, economic, social and cultural rights, discrimination against women, elimination of racial discrimination, children's rights, older people's rights, and the rights of persons with disabilities. In addition to measures that could be included in a Bill of Rights, we also recommend actions to address key shortfalls in Northern Ireland, so as to ensure compliance with the UK government's obligations under international human rights conventions. We have, for example, over a number of years, highlighted that there are key gaps in terms of policies and programmes aligned to a number of UNCRPD articles that need addressed. Finally, we consider that there is a need for additional measures to better protect equality and human rights in the context of Brexit. We ask the committee to take into consideration the impact of the loss of the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights and UK domestic law on equality and human rights post Brexit. We also ask the committee to note that whilst the UK government has made commitments under Article 2 of the protocol in terms of ensuring no reduction of certain equality and human rights as a result of Brexit, and indeed to keep pace with future EU changes to certain EU equality law, there are important limitations to those commitments. We have highlighted in our submission for the committee's consideration a number of ways in which the UK government and the Northern Ireland Assembly as regards areas within its devolved competence, how you could better protect equality and human rights after Brexit. I hope the submission that we made to you it was, was clear, but I'm joined today by my colleagues, Evelyn Collins, the Chief Executive of the Commission, and Rushing Malm, who is our Director of the Dedicated Mechanism Unit that we have within the Commission. So all three of us are here to answer any questions that you might have, and if you require us to elaborate on any aspect of the submission that we've already made to you. And in case I don't get a chance to um, follow that discussion, just to wish you well again in your deliberations and let you know that the Commission is here to work with you in partnership in, in developing the rights and how they might be incorporated. So thank you for the opportunity to address you today. Geraldine, thank you very much for that and thanks for the, the written submission you provided. I um, neglected at the start, I should have also welcomed Roisin and Evelyn. I can see Roisin now on my screen, but Evelyn hasn't appeared yet, so I don't know if she maybe is there um, and I just haven't um, got sight of her yet. But um, there's quite a bit of background, I don't know um, what's going on here. If I, if, I speak, if I speak, will I come into the spotlight? Yes, yes I'm here now, Evelyn. I, I was being very quiet, um, uh, so that's why you haven't seen me um, so far. But I'm definitely here. Thank you. No, sorry. No, um, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. I, I note that um, in the submission that you provided, you made reference to Brexit and the impact of, of Brexit and the review that the British government are, are currently um, doing. I wonder if you would elaborate on what your specific concerns are on that particular issue. Okay. okay. Right. Um, I think on that one, um, I'll ask Roisin as the uh, director of the dedicated uh, mechanism unit to answer your question on that. Roisin, can I ask you to come in, please? Uh, uh, thank you, Geraldine. Um, just in, in response, Emma, to your question, obviously, you know, the review is examining the relationship between domestic courts and the European Court of Human Rights. 
and the impact of the Human Rights Act on the relationship between the judiciary, the executive and the legislature. Um, and we know that the government has stated that it doesn't consider the scope of the review will cover substantive rights uh, in the Human Rights Act. Um, but what we have said in our submission um, is, it, is it important that if a Bill of Rights is introduced, that any steps taken in the wider UK context doesn't undermine or diminish protections in, in, in the Bill of Rights. Um, now, we haven't submitted a, a response uh, to the, uh, or submitted evidence in terms of, of the review as yet, but um, our, our concern is that even though it, it may not affect um, substantive rights, it, it may un undermine the way in which rights are protected. Uh, so, um, obviously, we wait to see the outcome of that review, but um, it, just the fact that it, the, the review doesn't include substantive rights it doesn't mean that the the human rights act can't be undermined so we, we will be keeping a watching brief on that thank you oh sorry Roshin, did you also want to address emma's question around the um charter resulting in a weakening of protection or concerns right that i think your question was twofold emma although i know You've invited us back in April to talk more about the impact of, of um, Brexit. But did you want to address that one, Roshin? Yes, sorry, Emma, if I, if I missed that part of your question, apologies. Um, um, you'll know from our submission um, that we have had concerns about the, the fact that the Charter uh, will, is, is no longer part of domestic UK law, although we note it will continue to play an important role in the interpretation of the withdrawal agreement uh, and the protocol um, and you'll know that in the absence of a Bill of Rights here that the Charter had gone some way towards filling in gaps in protection here, um, particularly in respect of socio-economic rights. And it has, in fact, been an important addition to the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, and, and, of course, you'll know that um, Article 21 within the Charter specifically included a clause uh, relating to uh, equality. So, um, as I said, we consider that the exclusion of the Charter from domestic law, despite the retention of underlying principles uh, and rights, has resulted in, in a weakening of the protection of human rights. We're also aware that um, there are different views um, as to the degree to which the Charter has impacted on equality and human rights across the UK. Um, and uh, one option for the committee is, is to consider... Uh, how a Bill of Rights obviously might address these issues. But it should, so I think it's also important to, to bear in mind in, in looking at that, that in addition to the loss of the Charter, um, we, we also have the, the, the negative impact of Brexit in terms of EU law here. So although we have uh, the commitment under Article 2, there is no um, commitment by the UK government to uh, keep pace with, with other forms of EU law, uh, future e equality law should say um as opposed to that um covered by the uh, uh, article two of the protocol so th there's two issues here there's the 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 loss of the charter and there's also uh, and the impact of that and also the impact in terms of the the, the the limitations of article two so so clearly as i say that's something we would um that the committee could consider and what's the most effective way of addressing that through a bill of rights um, uh, and also, it could it be done through, uh, for example, changes to domestic legislation? You'll see in our response, we have actually we have put through uh, and set out a number of recommendations for the committee in terms of changes to legislation, in terms of how um, human rights legislate, human rights could be strengthened uh, after um, Brexit, uh, and that has included, for example, introducing legislation to preclude conclusion or ratification of any international trade or investment agreement that would require or permit the reduction of human rights. So hopefully, Emma, um, that, that addresses your question. No, that, that's helpful. Thank you. I'm going to pass now to Mike, the Vice Chair. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Geraldine, Evelyn and Roisin for, for your engagement. <clears throat> Just two points for me. Um, Geraldine, you talked about uh, no regression on rights. Would that include progressively realised rights? 
So I keep getting messages, but my microphone's too long. So you have to bear with me while I use technology to come back off mute. Um, progressive, sorry, the realize, progressive realization of rights um, is a slightly different thing from uh, no diminution. Um, and there are other aspects to the no diminution that um, required sort of discussion as well. But um, the progressive um, realization is is about making sure that the resources, um, etc., necessary to implement new rights are um, made available in, in a timely way. But it is recognizing that nothing can be done, uh, or not everything can be done overnight. That it's a case of progressively over the years developing to where we want to be, and it's about making the rights relevant to today's generation as well as to future generations. But I'm going to ask everyone to come in to give you a little bit more information about the work that we've been doing in respect of uh, non-diminution, as well as the uh, realisation on a progressive basis. Evelyn? Um, well, thank you. In fact, I was going to pass it to, to, to Roisin. Oh, um, uh, Geraldine, sorry. Um, and as I said already, Mike, you know, we, we'll be back in front of the committee in, in April to talk about the work that we've been doing together with the Human Rights Commission on our role as a dedicated mechanism. So we can we can keep some of that work to, to run a couple of right with you. But I know your question was about the relationship between our clear call to have no diminution and no regression from existing rights that are available here at the moment through any bill of rights work and we're to get that has with progressive realisation which which Russian can deal with. Uh, well, just uh, uh, following up on that, uh, as Evelyn had mentioned, uh, we have set out in our uh, submission to the committee that one option for consideration is an obligation on government to achieve the progressive realisation of uh, the relevant rights in the Bill of Rights. Um, and um, our point reflects the fact that obviously the international covenant on economic, social and cultural rights and, and the way that that rights and that are framed and, uh, the, and within that the obligation of government to realise those rights is progressive rather than immediate, um, though obviously there should be no regression in those rights uh, in terms of change. Um, and I think the, the progressive realisation of rights reflects the right that certain changes to policies uh, can be expensive, they can take time to achieve, um, and also can be achieved at, at different stages. Um, so, uh, as I say, you know, one example of that might be changes to pensions that, that may, for example, indirectly impact on women, may be expensive to implement and make time to change. So, um, so that, that, that just gives you a little bit more background to the, uh, the point we were making, and I hope that was helpful. Yeah, uh, thank you, Roisin. I, mean, I, I guess what I'm saying is, as you suggest, the reason that we would have progressive realisation is because the right... Uh, is dependent on budget, uh, and the budget just wouldn't exist to be able to deliver it, say, in, in one financial year. And, and of course, for the Northern Ireland Assembly and its executive committee, we don't have control over our budget. It is, it is basically given to us by Treasury and the UK Parliament. So there could be a, a kind of path that we're on, uh, which, which we have to cut back on through no fault or desire uh, of our own. So that, it was just, just that point in terms of non-regression, that there might be on progressively realised rights, uh, circumstances beyond our control, uh, which, which would indicate that we had no choice. The, the other question was about whether if the UK Parliament votes uh, to change in any way the UK Human Rights Act, does that have implications for our progress? Okay. Um Evelyn, do you want to come in on that? The, the, human, the human Rights Act is, of course, a, a UK-wide act, so it would. And I think the, the issue would be how the executive and the assembly would deal with that in the context of the assembly and the executive law powers over a range of things that was barely pointed out, equality law being one. So even if there isn't a bit of rights, and we all, of course, hope there will be because... It, will be, it is very important that Northern Ireland, Ireland has a, a bit of rights reflecting the circumstances, particularly the circumstances here. But you could seek to enact legislation to strengthen 
equality law here. Um, some aspects of human rights then are devolved and some aspects um, are not. And that clearly would be an issue um, for yourselves to consider. Thanks, so it could get quite messy or challenging, shall we say. Yes. Okay. Thank, thank you all. Thank you, Chair. I'm sorry, I was a mute there. I don't have anyone else indicating at this minute, unless any of the other members want to come in and ask a question. I know that we have everyone online, but none of them are in the spotlight. Um, no one has indicated. You've got away very late. Chair, I think um, Paula and Carol. Oh, brown arm. Paula, if you want to come in, and then we'll yeah, bring Carol. Like, sorry, thank you. I actually had raised my hand on the way you function there, but no, 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 don't worry. I, I am. It's okay. Um, I, I'm just wondering, thank you very much, ladies, for your presentation today. I'm, I'm just wondering around the issue of the single equality bill, which, as you know, have been, have been battled about for, for many years, and whether or not you feel that a lot of the issues that you raise and the groups, the sectoral groups that you represent, would benefit just as much from a single equality bill, or are they not to, or, or, or they could both sort of sit very neatly along each side of each other? Thank you. Um, I, 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 okay, Evelyn, go ahead. Go ahead. And um, I think they would absolutely sit um, alongside each other. I think the importance of having a, a, a strong and effective um, Bill of Rights with a strong principle of equality in it does help give additional status to the, the principle and values of equality. And as Geraldine outlined in the introduction, you know, a clear message about the importance to society um, of equality, and that could be underpinned and sit alongside strong and effective um, single equality legislation. There are many, many gaps between uh, in, in protections now in Northern Ireland that we've highlighted over a decade now um, in, in different ways. Clearly, a single equality bill which strengthens all the individual aspects and improves protections here would, would be great. You know, amendments in addition if that's not possible, amendments to ex the existing legal framework, like introducing um, protection against age discrimination in the provision of goods and services. It, there's, there's gaps now between here and Britain in respect of the disability protections, in respect of gender equality protections, and so on. So really, um, the time is long overdue for single equality bill and strengthening equality law here. And we see no difficulty with that sitting alongside a strong and effective Bill of Rights with, with, a, with a strong principle of equality contained in it. Um, thank you. Um, I suppose following on from that, I'm very, very conscious that we've been discussing this Bill of Rights for um, decades uh, in this country, and there has been a lot, an awful lot of attempts to try and get uh, Bill of Rights agreed, and that has left people within different sections of society feeling quite let down. I'm very conscious that what uh, we need to do is deliver something through this process. Um, so I'm just wondering to what degree would a Bill of Rights need to very much reflect the uh, um, and, and almost highlight the individual groups that you mentioned there, women, racial equality, disability, old, older persons, or do you think that we had a really strong, robust, far-reaching single equality bill, but, but was it quite a tight bill of rights, but you could sort of link across to, would that be a solution? Or do you think that people would want to see their own individual issues on the face of a bill of rights, if that makes sense? It, it, it makes perfect sense um, as a question, and you have the the, the job of, of working through um, you know all the evidence and all the history of the twenty years of debate around what should be um, in a bill of rights. And there's a range of options. Um, you mentioned one. You know, does a, a principle of equality enumerate the groups which might be protected, or does it sit as a more general? If it sits more generally, how does it relate to possibly other principles in in a bill of rights? So those are, are clearly. Um, issues that you will be working through, and, and, and the commission is too. We were we were very clear um, in response to the NIO consultation about the Human Rights Commission, that was, you know, back when that was that we wanted to see as strong and ineffective, and highlighting the specific um, concerns of the groups that are protected by equality legislation. So, really, you know, there's lots to consider, as you've said, in that, and and we we'll give further consideration to to 
to that as well as you progress your thinking and we'll be progressing our thinking on that. And Roshan, did you want to add anything about the, the principles of equality? Uh, well, just just to add a, a couple of points. Um, Evelyn, firstly, maybe just go back and emphasising uh, the point about gaps in legislation. Uh, just uh, in, in response to your earlier question, Paula, um, we mentioned in our submission, for example, that there are gaps as regards public authorities um, in terms of public authorities functions, for example. We don't have equality legislation covering um, sex, age, gender reassignment, pregnancy, maternity, colour and nationality. So a very clear starting point um, outside of Bill of Rights is to address those gaps in, in, the, um, in terms of public functions and, and so that public bodies don't discriminate on those grounds which are covered in Great Britain. So that would be a, a first a good a starting point. Um, uh, you know, it, Another, in addition to what Evelyn's saying about an equality principle potentially covering and listing particular grounds such as disability or gender, um, obviously th that could include uh, a, not to discriminate on those grounds. There's the option of going further and, to, and um, for example, looking at substantive equal equality. Um, so there's so it's more about a, a more positive obligation in terms of, of addressing equality for those groups. Um, and just a sort of final point, you know, what we have also mentioned in our submission is around human rights standards and about courts and public authorities having regard to human rights standards. And that includes in, in areas such as the, the CEDAW Convention, um, which obviously relates to um, protection against women. There's the UN CRPD in terms of the Convention for Disabled People. So there are other ways in which you can, a Bill of Rights, you know, could could strengthen um, protection for, for a range of different equality groups. Sorry, thank you very much. Um, Sarah, can I just ask another quick question then around the um, EU Charter of Fundamental Rights? Um, and if you have any comment on how you feel we will be negatively impacted and how we can address the, you know, moving away from that as a result of Brexit. Um, Roisin or Evelyn, would either one of you like to take that question? I'm trying to keep them both of, um, outside down, if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bye. Oh, yes, you know, well, I had sort of sort of touched on it in in, in response to um, the earlier question there in terms of you know some of our concerns um, about the EU Charter and and how it might might impact um, and and obviously uh, uh, and, and we have said that we are concerned that it, it uh, could have a uh, could have a negative impact on equality human rights here post Brexit um, but we do note that it will continue to play an important role. In, in the interpretation of the withdrawal agreement and the, the protocol. Um, and despite the retention of underlying uh, fundamental rights and principles, uh, we do feel it has resulted in, in a weakening of the protection of human rights. I mean, uh, and as I mentioned earlier, clearly there's, um, there's different views on the extent to which the Charter um, uh, has weakened uh, protection uh, in, human, uh, in terms of human rights. And, and you'll know the, the UK government uh, was of the view that the Charter didn't create any new rights, was, but it was intended to catalogue the rights that already existed in EU law. Um, and it's considered that you know substantive rights uh, weren't um, reduced or weakened after Brexit. But others um, have, have taken a different view. And you, and you know the Joint Committee on Human Rights, for example, um, questioned that interpretation uh, of the UK government. Um, and, are, and it's been argued the Charter enabled, for example, individuals to bring legal action to strike down domestic legislation that's incompatible with a fundamental right. And that uh, isn't possible uh, under the current uh, European Convention of Human Rights. So, um, as I say, we, uh, in summary, uh, we do feel there has been a weakening of that and, and certainly would ask the, the committee to consider that. Thank you, ladies. Okay, Paula, we can now go to Carol. I know she has indicated that question as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Um, the, the questions I have really pertain to well, first of all, you've, you've answered the one in relation to Single Equality Act um, and that le legislation should almost be 
preferable around Equality Act and to a Bill of Rights. But the, the, the query I have is that often in some of the language, and I've raised this before at other presentations, that equality needs to have primacy over good relations. And if it doesn't, you're going to end up in the situation that we have in North Belfast where houses could be built because they couldn't get community agreement. So there was a, a an inequality there. But where, where, I mean, and it might be a strange question to ask, but where, where do you feel that a Bill of Rights, a comprehensive Bill of Rights, should be legislated for? Your question, Carol, is where do you think the Bill of Rights should be led? Isn't the, the provision in the Good Friday Agreement that it will be legislated for at Westminster level? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And uh, I mentioned earlier, there's obviously a patchwork of kind of devolved arrangements. The executive of the Assembly is responsible for the anti-discrimination legislation. Um, Westminster is responsible for the Northern Ireland Act, which contains, for example, the Section 75 duty. So um, it, it is a patchwork. I think it would be fair to say the Commission hasn't taken a view on on. You know, departing from what's in the, the Belfast Good Friday Agreement um, about a Bill of Rights, but it's certainly something that we could give consideration well, to. I, I, I'm not suggesting that you should. I'm uh -huh. suggesting that, I mean, certainly my concerns, and I'll, 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 I'll provide clarity, Evelyn, my concern is the, the current um, process around the Review of the Human Rights Act and Westminster's worrying. Mm -hmm. Uh, and given that process and given the fact that they have an international obligation to bring forward Bill of Rights as part as a go car tour the Good Friday Agreement, then it is important that you know that's recognised and it's also understood. The other aspect that I would like to have your view on is um you know, for example, and I think it touched on some of what Mike has raised around the social socioeconomic rights. And we we do hear language around progressive realisation and, and, and I do appreciate that, you know, it, it's certainly not straightforward. But if we were going to rely on budgets, particularly given the position that Westminster, after agreeing in a new decade, new approach, went from multi-annual budgets to annual budgets, then certainly rights that people have been waiting on are always going to be subject to affordability, and that has a big, big concern. So it's just your views on that uh, current reality for us and where it sits with the social and economic rights. Yeah. I mean, I think some of the social rights are covered, like the right to the right to not be discriminated in work, are covered by the anti-discrimination legislation. So I know you've taken some evidence from others to say there's maybe a kind of there's a more nuanced position that civil and political rights are so distinct and you know, easy to cover in the Bill of Rights and social and economic status rights aren't. But, um, you know, I, I think there are things like um, housing or employment that are clearly social enough that can be covered and effectively dealt with um, in, a, in a Bill of Rights. And we take your point and we, I don't think any of the prior commentators want to, you know, Geraldine or, or Rushing want to suggest that, that the lack of budget should be an excuse for for um, for not making progress on these things, that, that there's a reality and that's why the concept of progressive realisation is in place to recognise that you can't fix everything, you know, the next day. So that would be our view that, that progressive realisation and the Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland that sets out very clearly the direction of travel to create a better um, improve people's lives generally across all the disadvantage and vulnerabilities and inequalities that are that there are here, but that not everything can be done tomorrow. However much we would like it to be done tomorrow um, is really what we mean by that we want to see progressive realisation of rights, but that absolutely the direction of travel should be clear. Yeah, no, I, I wasn't suggesting that either journey nor rushing. Yeah. That say that people's rights should be based on budget, mm -hmm. but I also know that's a criticism. That has been a criticism out there. Um, for example, if you talk about language and cultural rights, sure. the first thing you'll hear is the cost of an Irish Language Act. And yeah. sometimes it's known the cost of everything and the value of nothing. So I'm not suggesting that anyone even went down that road, but it is it is a, a concern that we're all going to face. And I do agree, you know, even if... Um, there was a statement of intent and you progressively work towards having those full rights established and implemented. 
it's when they're not. Um, and then you get the other argument, as I'm sure you sort of well aware, that, you know, we've heard from previous uh, witnesses saying, well, it can't be a kitchen sink, you can't throw everything into it. And the question we have asked is, well, what rights do you cherry pick and what, what rights, you know, so we can't do that either. But no, it's helpful and, and I appreciate you are coming back along with the Human Rights Commission to discuss the uh, protocol and Brexit and all those lovely things. So I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Carl. I think that's everyone, unless anyone else wants to ask a question. I can see the clerk nodding at me. So, ladies, thank you very much for your time this afternoon and for joining us and for, for the briefing that you've provided. Um, and we'll let you take your ease now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks, Emma. Bye. All right, Slan. So, members, we're now getting a briefing from the Women's Policy Group, and we've got Rachel Powell and Louise Coyle joining us. If we can bring them up into the spotlight. Yeah, brilliant. Can see you both now. Welcome to the committee and thank you very much for, for joining us this afternoon. I know you provided a, a written briefing as well as the response that you had submitted to the consultation that we had carried out online. So I want to open it up to yourselves now if you want to, to give a verbal briefing. Yeah, thank you so much, Chair. Can I check you can hear me okay and there's no lagging? I've been having internet issues for like a month now. Um, but great. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to present to us today. So my name is Rachel Paul. I'm the Women's Sector Lobbyist with the Women's Resource and Development Agency. And I also chair the Women's Policy Group for Northern Ireland. And I'm going to start off to give a bit of an overview, highlighting some of the issues from the written submission. But I'm also uh, joined today by Louise Coyle, the director at the Northern Ireland Rural Women's Network. So we're both here on behalf of the Women's Policy Group. And we're kind of going to tag team this one. So I'll start off anyway. Um, so for us, there are really a number of reasons on why introducing the Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland is so important. And we really want to use this opportunity today to discuss what it should look like in practice rather than if we should have one. Um, so fundamentally, it would provide rights protections in line with key areas of social infrastructure that people rely on on a daily basis in Northern Ireland. So for example, uh, every day we rely on healthcare, adequate standards of living, uh, housing protection. However, none of these are currently protected as standalone human rights in Northern Ireland. And by making these protected human rights through a Bill of Rights, the government would then become accountable for ensuring that these are upheld uh, through facilitating the creation of mechanisms and institutions which can be relied upon to advance these rights. The women's sector, individuals, organisations and political parties have been calling for a Bill of Rights for more than two decades. Uh, and this evidence has been presented over and over again over the last 20 plus years. So we're not really going to go into too much detail. Oh, excuse me. Sorry. We're not going to go into too much detail about why we need a Bill of Rights, um, because honestly, we think it has been proven already. Uh, but the Bill of Rights was supposed to be developed to build upon rights contained within the European Convention of Human Rights by including supplementary rights uh, influenced by international standards uh, together with then local circumstances. But given the current time of uncertainty created by the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as Brexit, um, a Bill of Rights to us is more necessary now than it ever has been and could really provide people with assurances that whatever the future of Northern Ireland, the rights of all will be protected, respected and fulfilled. Uh, further, I know it was mentioned already about the uncertainty around the UK Human Rights Act, and there have been many threats made by the Conservative Party regarding the Human Rights Act and also around the European Convention of Human Rights. So we should really be taking this opportunity now to create a model of a Bill of Rights that really meets the local needs of people in Northern Ireland. Uh, as led out by the Women's Policy Group, COVID-19 Feminist Recovery Plan, the pandemic has truly had a disproportionate impact on women economically, socially, and in terms of health. And I know many of the members of this committee have worked very closely with us uh, on trying to highlight th this gendered impact. But we also know that there is evidence that Brexit is also most likely to disproportionately impact women the hardest economically, and that many of women's human rights have been gained through Brexit, particularly economic and social rights. A Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland does have the potential to provide important benefits for everyone in society, but particularly women as they are more likely to depend on formal rights protections for their safety, welfare, and working lives. 
particularly around economic and social rights, which are often considered the, the more costly ones or the softer human rights, these are the ones that impact women the most. And maybe that is a part of the reason why they're viewed this way. Introducing the Bill of Rights uh, is an integral aspect of our peace process and must be regarded as a crucial step in achieving full peace, equality and justice in Northern Ireland. And although we do acknowledge that uh, the Good Friday Agreement does require Westminster intervention, uh, the Northern Ireland Executive does have other powers to introduce and enhance rights, and these should be exercised to their full extent. However, in recent years, as we all know, there has been uh, some resistance, both at the NI Executive level and the UK government level, to introducing a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland. And I wouldn't particularly put a lot of faith uh, in our Secretary of State or the Westminster government on at any point in the next few years, developing a Bill of Rights. Um, so crucially to us, we think it is, is more important now than ever because over the past 23 years, there have been many human rights issues that remain unaddressed in Northern Ireland, and we continue to fall behind other UK regions uh, in regards to human rights standards. A Bill of Rights would also help avoid a, di a divergence of rights on either side of the Irish border after Brexit, for example, areas of protection such as violence against women, child maintenance payments, uh, these rely on EU-wide measures to ensure that the legal systems on the island of Ireland are fully coordinated to protect vulnerable people through the criminal justice and family law systems. This is absolutely essential to ensure that people cannot avoid the repercussions of things like violence against women or refusing to pay child maintenance by simply crossing the border. All aspects of the Good Friday Agreement need to be protected and implemented, including the Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland, where specific focus can be given to the rights of women. And I'll not go into too much detail about this, but you'll know that the Human Rights Commission provided advice uh, in 2008 on the content for Bill of Rights, and they specifically called for the inclusion of additional economic, social and cultural rights, including the right to health, which could incorporate gender sensitive and appropriate healthcare services and information the right to an adequate standard of living and the right to work, which could include fair wages, equal pay for equal work without distinction of any kind, issues that are still ongoing in Northern Ireland and not resolved, environmental rights, social security rights, children's rights, uh, and also that a number of rights will particularly help advance women's equality. And in accordance uh, with the intentions laid out in the Good Friday Agreement, the Commission advice also proposed adding to and strengthening many of the civil and political rights contained within the convention, uh, such as the right to freestanding, a freestanding right to equality, prohibition of discrimination, and the full and equal participation of women in political and public life. And also uh, the right for everyone to be free from violence, exploitation, and harassment, particularly including gender-based uh, violence as well. So the argument by the UK government that they did not see these additional rights as being as fallen within the test of being particular to Northern Ireland is not something that we would agree with because there are so many examples across these where Northern Ireland is much further behind when it comes to human rights. So just a few examples. We're the only part of the UK or Ireland without a childcare provision that is government funded. We're the only part of the UK or Ireland without a violence against women and girls strategy. We're the only part of the UK without a domestic abuse commissioner. Again, the only part without adequate perinatal mental health services, and we have no mother and baby beds or units in hospitals. We do not have any full implementation of 1325 on women, peace and security. We have much higher levels of poverty, particularly for single parents. 91% are women in Northern Ireland. We have no relationship and sex education. Uh, we still do not have equal access to abortion. Um, we have a strong history of historical abuse, such as through the mother and baby homes. We have major issues with women's employment with 30 percent of all women in northern ireland not working with the number one reason of this being for family and home commitments women's participation in public uh, life is still abysmally low um, we don't have the same access to health care either so for example fertility treatment and ivf treatment in northern ireland you only get one round through the nhs in gb you get three um, so these rights can be strengthened in devolved institutions, and we've seen this happen in Scotland and Wales, and that is where I see this committee of being, being of crucial importance. Um, so in Scotland and Wales, they have made strides to incorporate international standards into domestic decision making. And just last week, uh, Scotland took further action to implement CEDAW and other UN international mechanisms into their domestic law, and that is absolutely something we could do in Northern Ireland. However, uh, unlike Scotland and Wales, there was a provision made for Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland through the Good Friday Agreement, 
and this Bill of Rights was to be enacted through Westminster legislation. There is no such limit to the powers of Westminster to legislate uh, as there is for devolved institutions. Therefore, we do feel that with executive support on this, we could actually make really significant progress uh, on developing a Bill of Rights. The evidence, I'm just going to finish up now before handing over to Louise, but the, the evidence of gender inequality in Northern Ireland is vast and almost every single measurement of this is worse in Northern Ireland than any other part of the UK or Ireland, and in fact, from most of Western Europe. Uh, we can reshare our feminist recovery plan with you all alongside the expert advisory panel report uh, that myself and Louise were involved in on developing a gender equality strategy, because some of the stats on how far behind we are are truly striking. But the creation of a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland is a really unique opportunity for us to actually lead the way when it comes to advancing gender equality and becoming a world leader in eliminating discrimination against women rather than always being further behind than everywhere else. And in doing so, it could include an intersectional focus uh, to take into account the varying and compounding ways in which women experience inequality and discrimination as a result of differing personal characteristics and identities. It is clear that our equality legislation at the minute is not doing this and we were promised a Bill of Rights 23 years ago. It is time that we have some action on this. So I'm going to hand it over to Louise, who's going to give a quick overview as well of uh, moving beyond aspirational values and the cost of not implementing the Bill of Rights. Thank you. Thanks very much, Rachel. Um, so I am going to do a wee bit of the our soup bet in terms of the things that we would like to see included, um, simply because this is on, on public record and, and we want to make sure that it is recorded correctly. I know that the committee yourselves are aware of these, um, but we would like to see a Bill of Rights that has its basis in international law, such as the ECHR and the ICCPR. Um, we wanted to include the complete incorporation of the international standards, such as CEDA, ICESCR, CRC, ICERD, ICCPR, CRPD, the ECHR and CAT, including all those rights that were recommended also as Rich referred to the um, Human Rights Commission in their 2008 advice, because we feel that um, we can give further effect to those pieces of legislation. Um, and I know it sounds quite messy when you're just... <laughs> <laughs> talking about the letters there, but but there are specific pieces of legislation, which is why I listed them. Um, we feel that through the use of devolved powers, we really could give further effect to those pieces of legislation for the advancement um, for people in the North. Um, we wanted to include the incorporation of all the rights contained within the EU Charter of Rights. And we want, um, and I think Rachel outlined it very clearly, to have specific protections to women, um, which are sadly lacking here. Um, and very much in evidence. Um, women and civil society have welcomed the new decade, new approach commitment to the Bill of Rights. But 23 years on from the Good Friday Agreement, we desperately need some deeds and not words. Um, and we're really dependent on you as a committee to help us do that. Um, you know, much of the progress for women we know and women's rights and, and those intervening 23 years um, has trickled down to us from an EU level. And we are concerned that that's now gone. Um, the social and economic rights in particular have a potential to be absolutely transformational for women and communities. And, you know, I work for in rural uh, Northern Ireland and uh, particularly for rural communities. Um, they really need this. Um, as Rachel has outlined, um, COVID has both spotlighted and exacerbated the inequalities experienced in Northern Ireland. And we know that women have been disproportionately impacted here. And Rachel did refer to our feminist recovery plan, um, which I hope you all have uh, had a chance to look at. But the stats there are, are shocking. They should be shocking, but they are the reality. And they're the reality of what women um, here are living with. And it's not good enough. Um, um, but we've also witnessed many examples of our executive actually at their best during the COVID-19, um, working together, working across parties and departments and working really quickly to try and address the immediate needs. And we need more of that compassion, more of that ambition to do better and to deliver better for all of our citizens. And a Bill of Rights in Northern Ireland really provides a, a brilliant platform and a basis for this to override what Carol was talking about earlier, actually, with the Equality Commission, be able to override that, um, you know, the good relations aspect of things and actually 
it is probably why it is a Good Friday Agreement commitment because um, nobody knew better <laughs> than the people putting that together. The challenges that were in front of us all and, and trying to deliver um, for everyone here. Um, so we think it's a perfect baseline for, for doing that. Um, women were central to ensuring the end of violence here. They were central to ensuring uh, that there was um, massive support for the Good Friday Agreement. Um, they worked within their families, their communities to help broker a peace agreement. And they still work tirelessly every day to ensure that the Good Friday Agreement is and remains an opportunity for a better life for all of their children. They deserve for all of the commitments to be delivered. And the Bill of Rights is crucial commitment that has yet to be delivered. 23 years is too long. The new decade and new approach states the cross-party and cross-community support for a Bill of Rights in Northern Ireland, a commitment to advance of Bill of Rights, ensuring a new form of politics, which I think we all have a, have a passion for what is the best of us here. And we, as the women's sector and the women's policy group, really welcome the opportunity to support you with this, what we consider very long overdue, critical, but very vital work uh, and to support you as best we can. Thank you. Thank you very much. You both managed to cover an awful lot there in a, in a very succinct and, and, short, and short presentation. So appreciate that. And I know that the, the presentation that you provided in written form had covered a lot of this in a lot more detail. A lot of the presentations that we've had on up until this point, I've been asking the question around a Bill of Rights as an accountability measure. And I suppose going beyond that and one of the things that you had sort of highlighted that you don't want it to become is just a, a bill of rights in aspirational form and stopping at that but i think when we look at the events of the past couple of months and we've seen the publication of the mother and baby homes reports north and south and we can see that institutionalized misogyny was the order of the day and we still haven't got beyond that and there are an awful lot of examples there that you've given of real life examples so in terms of the the protections that have been afforded to women through eu directives and the sort of the working um laws that women predominantly rely on for protection and the fear there in terms of the review of the hra and even if you look back to before before Christmas and the internal market bill and how the British government were giving us all a very clear indication that they were prepared to play fast and loose with international agreements and with things that had previously been signed up to. And the, the, the sort of effect that that has then on the mindset of the population around you know, how important our integral rights are. But I suppose what I'm getting to, and, and in terms of asking the question, if, you know, every law that you pass, if you, if you think of it in the context of, being written into law and it then taking 10, 15 or 20 years for that to translate into the general population and to start having a change on in mindsets. How important is it then that we, if we have a Bill of Rights as an accountability measure and as something that governments have to, to stick to basically, that women's rights are enshrined there to ensure that the sort of stuff, so when you're talking about gender-based violence, I know we're debating a motion on this next week, we're, we're, we're calling for the, the Justice Minister to, to have a strategy on gender-based violence, but to getting, you know, ha having that written into law is one thing, but actually changing mindsets to ensure that that internalised misogyny starts to filter away and people stop thinking of those gender roles and the stereotypical biases and all the prejudices that we see playing out how important that is or how relevant that is to the process that we're currently in the, in the middle of. Yeah, well, I can start off if you're happy enough, Louise, and then we'll go over to you. So I suppose just with this sort of thing, you know, misogyny is so deeply ingrained in our society that it's completely normalised. Um, and we see examples of this all the time. Like recently, when there were five women stabbed in Belfast, we don't have the ad adequate laws to call that a misogynistic hate crime. And even at that, it's just totally diminished because it's like, oh, well, it's something that happens to women and it's normalized. And women are seen as a minority, but we're over 50 percent of the population. And, and that just shows you how much that uh, the discrimination that women face is totally normalized. It's such a, a huge group of our society, but it's still not a priority. And in Northern Ireland, we have some of the worst examples of gender ne neutral policymaking that you will ever see. And it deeply harms women. And just to give you the example of welfare reform. Uh, so the UN Special Rapporteur on Poverty and Human Rights described this as one of the most misogynistic policies he'd ever seen. But because we don't have um, a framework to ensure, well, we don't have one that's working properly really to ensure that the economic and social rights of women won't be negatively impacted by a policy decision, this was allowed to pass. 
and in Northern Ireland, um, well, UK wide, actually, the Treasury found that 86% of all savings that they made over the last 12 years of austerity came from women's income. And that should not be allowed. How can that how can that actually happen without any any group actually monitoring the decisions that are being made and seeing if they're actually violating the human rights uh, of our citizens? So I think similar to the progressive realization of economic and social rights, we need to be able to do that as well with changing the culture that exists here in the North with regards to misogyny and how women are treated particularly when it comes to gender-based violence. That is never going to change overnight. We are aware of that, but we aren't seeing any steps really being made to even start to address the gendered nature of it. Because when we make laws um, around issues such as domestic abuse, which is an issue that impacts everyone, there's still no recognition that it is majority women that are impacted. And we, we don't have a violence a, a, against women and girls strategy, but the rest of the UK and Ireland does. And what I see a Bill of Rights doing is actually looking at the international mechanisms like CEDAW, uh, like CAT, um, but also the Council of Europe Istanbul Convention, where the UK government is the duty bearer on these human rights, but they're failing people of Northern Ireland. So we would have a mechanism of actually ensuring that that international best practice and our international mechanisms are fully incorporated into our society and our legislative processes, but also looking at it as the entire executive as well and how each department has a responsibility. So yes, Violence against women, you would automatically think justice, but it's very much an education issue as well. And why are we not actually trying to deliver proper educational public awareness programs from a young age so that people understand how this culture is wrong and it needs to change? So I think a Bill of Rights, you know, for women to have access to their rights fully and to be free from inhumane, degrading torture treatment like that, we need to ensure that it is embedded across all departments because all departments have a responsibility when it comes to this. And it's the only way that we're going to see the evidence of it actually happening. And it's just evidence again of why a value-based aspirational Bill of Rights uh, isn't going to make a difference because these international human rights already exist. But without an actual enforcement mechanism, women are still having their, their rights completely violated. Um, so I've kind of gone on a bit there. So let's see if Louise wants to come in as well on this. Um, I think you covered it really well, uh, Rachel, but I think it is that about having that basis in the Bill of Rights is a real for everything else. I think it would be, it would also show that the executive as a whole acknowledge things like misogyny as an issue. Um, because you said very confidently, Emma, that it is. We very confidently agree with you that it is, but not everybody here does agree that it exists and it is a problem. So, you know, things like a Bill of Rights really does send that message. We do have a problem that we do need to address and we need a progressive realisation to address it. And that is, I suppose, what I meant when I said we need to be ambitious for for the future and we need to be you know sending a message from our whole executive to what kind of a society we want so yes we want an aspirational future of course embedded in 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 the reality of, of a bill of rights that that actually gives people a tool and a mechanism to challenge Yeah, no, thanks to you both. And I suppose that's what um, I'm getting at. And, and you both struck that and that it's great to have these things sitting here as this is the society we want to have, but it needs that action to follow it up and it needs that implementation. But I suppose changing hearts and minds is is the thing. Um, Mick, are you on there? Sorry, I've only got anybody that's in the spotlight. Yes, I'm here, Chair. Go right, sorry. Okay, hi, Louise. Hi, Rachel. Hi, um, Mike. Hey, uh, for, for, first off, am, am I right in thinking that you're, you're really advocating for group rights rather than individual rights? Uh, did you want to take that, Rachel, or will I go? Uh, well, I'm not really sure what the question means. Would you expand it on it, please, Mike? Well, I, I think we're, we're, some people say you, your Bill of Rights should be for, for individuals rather than groups or communities. Okay, yeah, I, I know what you mean. So I think I think really a Bill of Rights would ensure that every individual has the access to the same rights. But what we also want to be considered is the intersectional impact of people's lives. So, for example, a disabled woman is going to face 
She should have the same individual rights as any other person in our society, but there needs to be a recognition of the additional levels of discrimination that she faces for being a woman and for being disabled. So it's really about recognizing the individual rights that we should all have by recognizing that different groups don't have them because of their background. And, and you need to have that understanding of the group discrimination that happens to people based on their intersectional identities. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Thanks, Rachel. Um, now, you, you, you probably know from the All Party Group on UNSCR 1325, I'm keen on looking at embedding gender budgeting. So, I mean, you're making the point that, that austerity has hit women's uh, incomes a lot harder than men's. You know, if, if as an executive for an assembly, we decided that um, social housing was a big priority and we were going to invest huge amounts of money in construction, actually, one of the impacts of that would be that the, the new jobs that would be created in construction would really disproportionately favour men over women. Whereas if we said we're going to put this money into social care, into a care sector, it would disproportionately bring up women's employment. So is that something you would like to see embedded in a Bill of Rights if it was possible to, to write it in? Well, I think it would be good to even have people actually thinking about those sort of consequences because I don't think that happens at present where a budgetary decision is made and there is an analysis of how it's going to impact men or women differently because it doesn't happen right now. If it did happen, a lot of our policy decisions wouldn't be made. Um, and a lot of people would have been saved from austerity, I would say. But so just in that example, I think by doing gender budget and then actually doing a proper analysis of how women are impacted, the investment in social care. So there's actually been a lot of research on this through the Women's Budget Group UK, and they have shown that an investment into care and it provides twice as many uh, jobs for women as as uh, the same investment into construction, but also uh, 1.2 times more jobs for men as well. So a lot of the time people think of, of our gender segregated sectors in Northern Ireland and think if we invest in childcare, only women are going to benefit. But it's not true. Men benefit as well. And it's maybe about looking at looking at these sort of decisions where we have a limited budget and we can only choose one or the other. I think we should really be assessing well which one positively impacts uh, the most people. Because quite often when you look at uh, social care as one of the main examples, you know, Everybody in Northern Ireland is impacted by social care. Um, our unpaid carers in Northern Ireland save our economy four point six billion pounds a year, um, and it's totally undervalued as a sector because it is predominantly women. But if we invest in that and try to make it a more gender diverse uh, sector as well, but also you know it could be seen as our green sector. Um, it is a low emission sector and we need to start looking at where Northern Ireland is going in the future, addressing the climate emergency, looking beyond construction and technology and looking at the sector that's already there. Um, so I think, honestly, Mike, I would welcome those sort of thoughts before making a policy decision because it's not happening at all at present. We're going to let Louise come in if she wants to. Um, just to say that I totally agree with that and I am... Um, totally in favour of gender budgeting um, because I think not only would it benefit women, um, it would definitely benefit men as well to start thinking. So therefore, our whole society, if you start thinking about how we spend money and who is impacted by this money that we spend in a positive way, um, I think gender budgeting has the potential to be transformed actually in how we think about things. Um, so I'm um, Hugely passionate about that. Um, as Rachel said, it's not happening. The Bill of Rights would be a great place to, to start embedding it, um, especially if we're trying to do something, you know, something new and shiny. I really think the Bill of Rights has such a potential um, to, to for Northern Ireland to lead on something and, and to be doing things better than everybody else. I mean, Rachel outlined earlier just how far behind we are, you know, even our nation's close to us in so many areas. But, you know, Yet we have brilliant people here and it's, it's you know, I'm passionate about the place that I live, as I'm sure all of you are. And I would really love to see us actually, um, you know, leading on something like gender budget and, uh, and how we go about doing our business here. Yeah, well, I agree with Rachel, Louise, when she says, you know, a great start would be just that people were more, even just knew of it and were aware of it and its implications. But... I do think we've got to go further than that because, you know, I mean, we have Section 75, but I, I now wonder sometimes whether it's the help 
or a hindrance with regard to something like gender budgeting. So if we could find a form of words that would embed it as a, as a duty into a Bill of Rights, um, yeah. I think that is the only kind of solid way forward to ensure that, that, that the mechanisms and the people running uh, the, the public sector understand things. Because I mean, I don't have those construction versus care figures in front of me, but when the all-party group were presented with them, I mean, they are just, they are eye-watering in terms of the, the implications, one way or another. Uh, yeah. And yet, you know, if, you, if you're sitting there and you're saying we need to build social housing, the instinctive thing is to say, yeah, let's, let's put our money into that. But you've got to think through what are the other implications, the potential downsides, and that's where gender budgeting, I think, I think works. But listen, thank you both very much. And Chair, thank you. Thanks. Okay. No problem, Mike. I'll, I probably should say at this point that I've got a PMB coming forward on gender budget, and so maybe maybe we'll get it in through that way. Mm -hmm. um, I can see that Carl has indicated, and I believe Paula and Mark as well. So if anyone else wants to come in, just raise your hand. Carl, go away. So um, thanks very much, Louise and Rachel, for your presentation. And um, it's great to see that energy. I'm not being patronising. It's just that Thursdays are normally long days for Certainly myself and Paula, we've been sitting on health from quarter past nine this morning. So forgive us if we're not, well, certainly if I'm not um, at, at full power. The, 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 see, the issue I have is I agree with absolutely everything you say, but I've also got the experience of a three-year hiatus in the Assembly because people blocked rights. And despite that, I'm still optimistic. Um, and... I think everybody's common to be fair to everybody in this committee, you know, even though some of us are more vocal than others. We want to try and give our, our best efforts to try and get as much realised out of this as possible. The issue I have is quite simple. Um, I am really concerned that because, and I don't know if you heard my question to the Equality Commission earlier, you know, an absence of a single Equality Act and then the ongoing review of the Human Rights Act in Britain. And the review would certainly indicate by certainly some of the commentary from some Conservative MPs that do, they would do away with as much of the Human Rights Act as if they got away with. So, that, I mean, that's a concern that I would have. And then an absence of social and economic, even progressive realisation that everything you've just said is going to be dependent on availability of budget. And that leaves us all, men, women, children, leaves us all very vulnerable. So the question I would have is, um, and I suppose it, it also relates to some of the points that Mike has made, like we don't, we, we're lucky to have Section 75, but if you've still got people who are prepared to fight, like an anti-poverty strategy in court, and spend all that public money fighting that, then that's the that's context that we're in. And I know every institution has its problems, but ours are certainly historic and they're certainly current as well. So I suppose the thing is, you're arguing that there definitely needs to be social and economic rights as part of the Bill of Rights. In terms of the, and I agree with you, in terms of the, the gender strategy, I mean, we had, a, we had a gender strategy that didn't mention women, like go figure, seriously. Um, but the, there is a gender strategy now in three communities, and hopefully that will yield some of the, the stuff that needs to happen. And as much as we can get done, the better. But, you know, in terms of gender budgeting and in terms of current inequalities, so most women who are living homeless, sofa surfing and hostels, are they're women. So... And if, for example, we had a social housing program, makes right, you might have more men getting apprenticeships and whatever. You might, you'll, you'll, you'll certainly have more women than what the, the last housing program built was, but you'll, you'll get certainly predominantly male. But no one's arguing that all the money should be spent on women. We're just saying that women have specific rights and have been impacted by adverse inequality. So that needs fixed. But in absence, you know, in absence of... Westminster legislating for a bill of rights. What else is there, you know, and where else do we go with all the issues that you've just raised? And, and I'm not saying that in terms of being defeatist about it. I just, um, 
I just have concerns when I hear what's ongoing in Westminster at the minute. And but at the same time, we're right to be persistent and dogmatic and standing up for for rights now. And this is the right time and the right committee to do that. And so, just just some of your thoughts on that. And again, I think the thirteen twenty five stuff. Like, there's a lot of initials throughout, but. The thing that sits really on my chest is that there's been abuses of human rights here for decades and Britain has got away with it. And economic and social rights are right in the middle of that as well. And the only people that can, you know, in my opinion, yes, but the, the British government is co towards a Good Friday Agreement definitely need to bring forward a Bill of Rights. But when it comes to running departments and budgets, that's where we all individually have to step up. And keep stepping up. So it's it's just what what else does it you think that we need to do? Um. What, will I start with that, Rachel? Yeah. Um. I think um we are apolitical, but of course we are as concerned as anybody about the conversations that are happening in Westminster around the HRA. Um. The Conservative government. Um. I don't think it's it's a cr to criticism of them. They've been very open that they are. They are a government about business and and the 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 difficulties that, that they might have around those things that are very precious to us as women, such as maternity leave, paternity leave, work and time directives. We uh, can read between the lines as the women's sector and see that how those may not fit very nicely with uh, with a government that that is about big business. Um, so we're very concerned <laughs> about the chatter that's going on there. Um, we're not oblivious to it. And I think the fact that post-Brexit, they've got Henry VIII laws now for all those things that transferred over. They don't even have to come to scrutiny um, on the, you know, the on on, on the, the floor. Um, they're not going to go to the House of Commons nor the House of Lords. So they, whatever government's in charge can do whatever they like with those. That That's what the rules have given themselves. That puts us in a very, very precarious position as part of the UK. And I suppose that is why we think it is imperative that we have a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland, that we are protected against any change that may be coming down the line that might be negatively impacting on women. We're so far behind as it is, we can't afford to slip any further. And I would say that all of our citizens here are not across that detail. You know, no matter how many conversations we have about it, um, people assume that the rights they currently enjoy are going to continue, you know, they don't consider that they might be uh, um, sitting precariously in, in a Whitehall office at the moment. So um, we need to do what we can here as a devolved nation to protect our, our people who live here. And the Bill of Rights gives us the opportunity to do that. Um, look, the UK government are a co-guarantor of this internationally binding agreement um, and are the Irish government and um, in terms of, of rights uh, and, and even the Bill of Rights we because we kind of felt comfortable and protected by being European citizens um, we, we've kind of left them off the hook on this one and um, and you know I think as a community sector we're quite happy to start putting pressure where it needs to go and support you with that Um you know, none of us can make them do things, but we can certainly put pressure where it needs to be. Um, I concerns me that people look at budgets first and then think, what can we do with this wee bit of money we've got? <laughs> um, I think that's how we've been doing things for a very long time here. It's clearly not working. Um, and also this kind of blindly keeping, resourcing the things we've all because well we've always resourced that so that bit of budget we can't even count that now um we need a whole holistic overview of of how things are here and and what is resourced why it's resourced what benefit there is and i know that that is a huge piece of work that needs everybody's um you know everybody's in and everybody's agreement and we know we're not all that super good at that here um but i guess i think I, I am hopeful that something like a Bill of Rights, could, if it, if we could get an agreement on that, it would take a bit of the sting out of those other things. It would stop being the constant renegotiation. Of um, Rachel and I were both sitting on the expert panel for the gender equality inclusion strategy. So we're 
really uh, passionate about the potential that that has, but we can see it under tack already. I don't know if you caught that newsletter article at the weekend. Um, I'm sure you did, but um, that hasn't even gone to public consultation yet. That hasn't even got input from the public and already it's under attack. And, you know, that's the place we live in, Carol. We're not under any illusions. <laughs> you know, there's a reason why things are, are as far behind as they are. Um, but that doesn't mean that we all have to sit back and accept it. And I would agree that Section 75, whilst it's so important, and beneficial for Northern Ireland to have it. The fact that gender men and women are are seen as a minority group, it has not really had the yeah. benefits for women that it should. And also the understanding and the application of Section 75 is critical. And recently, particularly, um, we have seen a really poor application across a range of departments in the application of um, e EQIA screenings, for example. Um, yeah. Which means that when we're responding to consultations, we're also having to respond, we're almost having to rewrite the EQIA, you know, which is time and energy that honestly we don't have right now. <laughs> um, because we had that hiatus, there is a huge push pressure on our sector at the minute to be responding to consultation is massive. And and we're actually all running into the ground at the minute trying to do that. And it doesn't help when it, those things haven't been done correctly because it means we nearly have to start from scratch say no <laughs> here's all the evidence you should have taken into account yeah so, so very long no, answer. <laughs> no listen listen um, I, I feel it because I'm, I'm learning myself mm -hmm. and the important thing is despite all the obstacles we're not giving up so that's the long short of it yeah, uh, Carol, I was just going to respond to it quickly as well. Um, like I, I share your same concerns uh, completely and you know I don't particularly have much faith in the Westminster government on on really making an effort on these issues. And that's why I think it's really important that this committee really does work together to show that, you know, we want Northern Ireland to be a place that's actually leading the way when it comes to rights, uh, because everyone in our society benefits from that. And there are always going to be people that are critical, but I think we need to look at it in context of our conflict. So when, when the Good Friday Agreement happened and, and, you know, there was a whole focus on the peace process in the women's sector, they often said that it was a political peace process, not one for women. And the women didn't really benefit very much because, to be honest, you know, a lot of these issues that we've raised today, um, people were raising before the Good Friday Agreement. So, like, no, ex no support for childcare, disproportionately high levels of domestic violence and violence against women. You know, these aren't new things. And the women's sector was able to work together before there was any ceasefire to ensure that they were working together to try and advance the rights of women. And Louise did mention some of the pressures that we've been under in the sector were underfunded massively. And all of these issues that we've been raising, these have been getting raised for decades and we're saying it over and over and over again and nothing is changing. Um, and the situation of women's lives, you know, it's, it's dramatically worsening. And now at the minute with COVID, um, it's incredibly frustrating because we, when we published our feminist recovery plan last year, we provided a really comprehensive overview of the evidence that pre-existing inequalities were dramatically worsening. And we made key recommendations on how these could be solved. Um, and I'd say that out of the, you know, 150 plus recommendations, we've probably seen changes in about two. Um, and then, you know, looking at new decade, new approach, no reference to women at all in the whole thing. Uh, looking at the economic recovery plan that was released as well a couple of weeks ago there's zero mention of childcare. i don't know how it can't be seen as one of the biggest factors in our economy it's essential to our economy but also the only reference to women was to do with women and apprenticeships and in stem and you know there's no recognition of the fact that 30 percent of women in northern ireland are forced out of the workforce because of barriers that exist uh, structurally in our society so i think it's really important that we use this opportunity to meet the needs of our people here locally rather than relying on other bodies to do it. Um, I don't think it's going to happen through Westminster because looking at the Women and Equalities Committee as well, they want to turn away from looking at actual intersectionality and identity. Um, they are being extremely uh, harmful towards trans women, for example, coming out of that committee. And we presented evidence to them uh, of the disproportionate impact COVID was having on women and they, they didn't even respond. Um, and, you know, we provided about 60,000 words of evidence uh, specific to Northern Ireland. So I think that we need to be doing this locally. 
look at what Scotland and Wales are doing. They're so far ahead of us when it comes to gender equality because they are using devolution to their advantage and incorporating international human rights law into their local law because that is, you know, to me, that should be the main benefit of devolution. So in the absence of Westminster actually implementing the Bill of Rights, I see no reason why our executive can't be doing things like implementing CEDAW into our local law and all of the recommendations that come with it. Um, so I think there's loads that could be done. Uh, you know, even looking at 1325, uh, it isn't implemented in Northern Ireland and there's no recognition of the conflict here in the UK's National Action Plan. But the women's sector very much implements all pillars of 1325 you know we're not waiting on them to do it for us we're doing it and it would be brilliant to have our whole executive supporting us with that carl is that you happy days paula i know you were looking in um, thank you, Chair, and thank you, ladies, for coming today. I, I think a lot of the questions I was going to ask are um, you, you covered. I just wanted to say how powerful it was. And uh, like um, Carol, I'm feeling a little bit tired, but that's really, really energised me, what you were saying. Um, I suppose my concern really, it is so clear from what you have both contributed there, what we need to do as a, as a Bill of Rights ad hoc committee in terms of our recommendations. I'm absolutely behind every single thing you've said there. I suppose the concern is that, and the question I'd raised with the last panel, it's, it's in relation to how do we actually get to the point where we don't have square brackets around our recommendations to the executive office? How can we get a consensus and agreement around what exactly a Bill of Rights should do? And how do we then marry that up with this whole notion, which I think is very outdated now, which is um, about making sure that it relates to the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland. And so further to that then is, could you speak to how you feel that the legacy of the Troubles is still impacting upon women and families today? Thank you. I don't know if you want me to go first, Louise, or if you want to. You go first, Rachel, and I'll... Yeah, no bother. Uh, well, big questions, Paula. <laughs> and it would be brilliant if we could you know, find the answers to them straight away and start working on it. But I think... Uh, I, I really think that for our executive and, you know, acknowledging the very specific circumstances in Northern Ireland and how the conflict has impacted groups, I think the clearest example of how we've been failed is when you look at women, if you look at women, regardless of their community background, of their race, their religion, if you look at all of the Section 75 groups, when you look at the women of those Section 75 groups, it's worse. Uh, and the data is so strong on this. We have so much evidence of how women have been failed in Northern Ireland because I think for too long we were focused on just the peace process and conflict, but never incorporated women into that. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of lessons that could be learned from the women's sector on this, on how to work together and move forward. And I know there are different uh, opinions on a Bill of Rights on this committee as well and across our executive, but I, I really think that the groups that have been presenting evidence so far, we're doing this because we're on the ground working with these groups on a daily basis and we know what it is that they need for their lives to be improved. And I really think it should be the duty of the committee and all of our elected representatives to be listening to that evidence um, and to be looking at us as experts on these issues because we are informed by women's lived experience the same way that other groups presenting evidence are informed as well by their own groups. So I think it's really challenging uh, to know what would be the best way to do this, but I think it should be evidence-based and that that should, we shouldn't have different rights not included over opinion. I think we should be looking at data and how people are impacted um, because that, you know, isn't going to, that really can't be denied. And I think having a Bill of Rights in place would have protect, protected us significantly during the three-year collapse um, because, you know, the enforcement mechanisms would be there and there would have been ways for people to ensure they had access to their rights uh, when there wasn't an executive in place. So, I just think we've waited long enough now and the feelings have just continued to mount on top for each other that um, we really deserve better. And I think it should be the shared goal of everyone in our executive, regardless of what political party they're in, that Northern Ireland could be a world leader on something and that could be on advancing rights um, and equality in our society because it benefits everyone. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, I would say that the one thing that supersedes the binary politics that we live in here is no matter 
what happens actually when there's something positive, like when the executive did reform, it it gives people hope and it get collectively, no matter which where you are <laughs> in the binary scheme of things. And you know, I think the Bill of Rights is an opportunity for that. Of course, it it will be seen by some as an opportunity to to divide as well. And you know, there's no question. I think certainly around, among our members are from all backgrounds in the Northern Ireland Rural Women's Network. And when you get people talking about disability and health and education and those very real issues, they're very vocal, they're very capable about talking about them and they understand the inequalities. Um, do they couch it in that form of rights and equality? Not necessarily. And I do think that, that some parts of our community are more comfortable with um, talking about rights and equality and seeing it as something that belongs to them and something that they should have. Um, I think there's there's no question that there, that um, I suppose our conflict and, and our continued politics has created that dynamic there. Um, but actually, when you break it down, you know, we all understand that rights and equality are actually for everybody. They only work if they're for everybody. Um, they don't work if they're if they're seen as belonging to, to one group or another. Of, to, to move past that is when we start talking about disability and women and health and education because everyone does understand that that is about me that they're talking about something that's important to me um, and, and that I'm invested in um, so I think certainly for women in general they're less invested in the big picture politics stuff and they are more interested in those conversations uh, and they're very um, they're very much in agreement on those things there is no, you know, um, during the whole Brexit thing, I happened to, to be, as I'm sure all of you were, I was, I was called to a meeting um, with uh, a European um, group who wanted to know how they were for women here and, and how they were thinking about Brexit and were saying, like, when you get your women together, are they, you know, like, almost like sitting on opposite sides, you know, like the, <laughs> you know, all the unionists and orange women all are sitting here and, and, and others are sitting there. And I says, absolutely not. Uh, in fact, and all the time I've been working, and I don't think that has ever happened, because women, when they get together, all talk, and they're all talking about the same things. The same things are important to them. So I think it is a, there is an onus on the executive to sell this again to everyone. I know there is a mandate, of course, for it, um, but to remind everyone that this is the is business for all of us this is this is long overdue business for all of us and it's actually about you and enthuse everyone again about it um we obviously do that at a grassroots level where we're at but i think i think there has to be some political responsibility to do the same thing um um in terms of the impact on of the conflict on women i don't think women have been afforded the same opportunity um you know to even have their voice heard since our Good Friday Agreement, that 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 men have, uh, you know, I, I've lost count of how many times, um, maybe you know, one or, or or two women in the room, and I'm sure that is no different. I know that it's no different for for all of you, women, um, in the assembly, and 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 even just the kind of misogynistic tone that that you are subjected to. I know that discussion on um, the abortion. Right. I mean, some of the behaviour and that tells us how far we have to go in terms of women's voices even being respected and listened to what we have to say. Um, it's not there yet. We know it's not there yet. Um, and the only way to do that is to keep challenging it. But a Bill of Rights would really embed that as, you know, um, the are important and the visibility of women. We should have 1325 implemented here. The reason 1325 across the United Nations that if you engage women on a 50-50 basis post-conflict, your conflict, uh, you know, your peace is much more sustainable. And we know here, I mean, we're just out of an assembly having it collapsed for three years. We know that our peace is precarious all the time. You know, we're on a journey. We're still on that journey. We haven't had that uh, peace totally realised. And I am so passionate about by the engagement of women in that, you know, I mean, I happened to be at the meeting with um, Mara Shevkovich and um, Michael Gove a few weeks back on meeting with civil society organisations. There was myself and Katie Howard were the only two women in the room. So my first question was, where are the 
women, who are you talking to? When you're talking to civil society, who do you mean? <laughs> you know, that's the reality here. And and I think that is it has been such a disservice to women um, to not be engaged on, a, on an equitable basis. I could talk all day about that. Stop. No, no, you, you fairly nailed it there. Thanks very much again, ladies. It's very powerful, as I say. Okay, Paula, I know that Mark has indicated that he would like to ask a question as well. Thank you, Chair, and thanks to the Louise and Rachel for that. It was uh, very interesting to hear. I was particularly interested in the thoughts around devolution and, and how it can, how it could, and how it should work, how other places are making it work. They have like devolution plus, and often, if not always, it feels here like we're operating as devolution minus. I know there's so many areas that, that we do fall beh behind in, but it's when you hear them listed, as uh, Rachel did there, and I know that wasn't an exhaustive list, but mm -hmm. child, child care is certainly a huge issue, and its absence from the economic recovery plan is just baffling, but but that, that plan itself, I don't know how much of a plan <laughs> or what sort of strategy there, there is behind it. I know that's a debate for another place and another day perinatal mental health, access to health care, and then welfare reform, which is still an issue, as you will be well aware, and the sector will be, uh, as we try to negotiate a new and improved mitigation package to sort of mitigate against some of that uh, economic harm and social harm that's caused primarily to, to, to women as a result. But, I mean, the impact of welfare reform bill, for example, wasn't unforeseeable, and, and nor was it unforeseen. And and we do have things in place like Section 75, like EQIA, but this still got through, you, you, you know, and, and for, for me, that, that demonstrates an inherent weakness that those safeguards haven't stopped the passage of a bill that has such a disproportionate a negative impact on a, a section of society, and, and in this instance, women. I mean, a Bill of Rights isn't going to address all these issues overnight, but I think it's vitally important to address a particular issue of gender inequality. I was just wondering, Giz, have you seen any kind of examples where we aren't lagging behind other areas. Because if you look on the face of it, someone outside looking in would see our executive, would see we have two female heads of government and half the ministers are, 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 are women. Is there anywhere where we're actually doing well? That's, I think that's the hardest question yet, <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, but in terms of where we're doing well, like I think... The fact that we have Section 75 in place and these equality screening mechanisms, that is something that doesn't necessarily exist across the rest of the UK or, or Ireland. So that is one area where you could say, yes, we have added protections through the nature of our devolution and we have additional scrutiny processes that don't exist uh, in GB. So particularly committee scrutiny and for the women's sector and other groups, like to, to be able to do this today, that is something that we do have better than other areas but I must say um, devolution could be so much better here and you just need to look at Scotland in particular Scotland is just leaps and bounds ahead of us on almost every issue uh, when it comes to gender equality and Wales are too and I think that we could be looking at them and and doing better here so childcare being the main example so you have your 30 hours of free childcare in England, Scotland and Wales but it's in some areas, it follows the child. In other areas, it's only for working parents. In other areas, you know, it, it just depends. And what we tend to see happening when there is a devolved policy in Northern Ireland, um, what happens is they look at what they did in England, Scotland or Wales, divide that by our population and then roll out the same thing. And like we could be doing so much better than that because Northern Ireland is a small place. Our voluntary and community sector is extremely close knit and works together on a whole range of issues. We have a group of people working on different issues with high levels of expertise that could work closely with our executive. And I think there needs to be more of a willingness of not just looking at the volunteering community sector and thinking, you know, for example, I'm on the joint forum and it's supposed to be where 
uh, you know, the the public bodies and the voluntary community sector can yeah. learn from each other. And it feels one sided a lot of the time where we're giving all of this evidence over and over and explaining the benefit of that. But it's not actually seen as something that's a real priority for uh, a lot of the time, you know, different ministers or departments. So I think the smallness of this place should be should, we should be using that to our advantage. Um, we should be connecting the experts on the issues and with just some examples of how we could do better here. So the economic and social harm of welfare reform, um, the women's sector could have told everyone about that before it was passed. And they did and have continued talking about it ever since. But we're still not, you know, we still have a two child cap, uh, which is severely harming single parents. 91% of them are women. There is the power to change that. That needs to change. The bedroom tax as well, the way PIP is done. You know, there's been cases with with how disabled women are treated through private assessments that are, are just massive violations of human rights. We have the power to change that on a devolved way. But looking particularly at, at the economic and social harm of COVID, all of this is because of the pre-existing inequalities that are now worsened. And we don't have a breakdown uh, of how many men and women are on universal credit. You know, to me, that is absolutely baffling. It's one of the newest benefits that we have. Why would we, we not want to know how many men and women are on it? Because we know the, the amount of women has just gone through the roof because they are working in the areas disproportionately impacted by COVID. Um, we know as well that way more women are furloughed uh, based on GB data, but we don't have that in Northern Ireland. We have no requirement to give the gender of the staff that you're making that you're making redundant. But again, we know that women have been worse impacted by this. There are so many small, simple changes that we could be doing at a devolved level that would give us a much better picture of what's going on. Rachel. So we could actually respond. Yeah, Rachel, can I just to sorry to cut across there, but I just wondered just when you're referring there to things that we can do at a devolved level. Obviously, without mitigations, women would have been worse impacted. Do you, do you want to give any detail to that? Because yeah, so, are yeah. Important, obviously. Women absolutely would have been worse impacted by that, without mitigations. But I'd like to just echo something that was mentioned earlier by someone in the presentation before ours, where if you have to provide mitigations for a policy for years after it's been implemented and without it, you know, people's lives are going to be much worse. If anything, to me, that's evidence that that policy should be scrapped. And, and, and isn't working. Um, why would we have welfare reform packages in place that people can't survive on and constantly have to try and scramble to find the money for mitigations? It doesn't make sense. Um, but when we, uh, I suppose on, on line with that, then that it goes back to the key issue for me for an awful lot of the problems that we have in the north of Ireland, and that is that we don't have autonomy on a lot of these uh, situations. So I know that you're saying there about policies being scrapped, but obviously we don't have the power to do that. So that's the, the British government that that uh, Im implement these these decisions, and then we have yeah, to Like I, I totally get that. I do, Chair. Uh, but I do think that there, there could be more done at an executive level as well. You know, some responsibility needs to be taken there because looking at Section 75 and EQIS as an example, the reason why I don't think they work is because they're, they're ta tacked on at the end of a policy decision mm -hmm. rather than being at the very beginning. And it's the same with gender budgeting. You know, if that had been, if that is fully embedded across our institutions in Northern Ireland, um, I think it, it would give our devolved structures so much more of an opportunity to challenge these decisions happening. Uh, at other levels and being passed on passed on to us. So really the Bill of Rights will be one way of doing that where these considerations are done at the beginning before any policy is rolled out. And that includes ones that are happening at a UK wide level. Um, and it gives us more of an option to actually challenge it. And to do that, you need to be considering these issues at the beginning and you need to have the data to back it up. We're not even recording that data and it's so easy to do it. Um, so I, I just don't think we're helping ourselves even on ones that aren't fully devolved. Um, so by strengthening our devolved powers uh, elsewhere as well, such as you know, bringing CEDAW in, it would really strengthen all of this. I, I'm yeah. conscious I've talked quite a bit there, so I'm going to go to Louise. <laughs> Um, I suppose I just wanted to say in terms of, I think you were kind of um, hinting at there, Emma, that at least we do have the mitigations and that is a benefit for people in, in the North to not be entirely destitute. Um, but you'll also be aware that as vital as those are, um, lots of the members of our women's policy group are also members of the Cliff Edge Coalition who have been, you know, continuously all this time to try and ensure that those mitigations don't just, as they say, fall off a cliff edge every March. 
and it ends up being every March because of how we do budget in here and uh, and, and how the executive um organizes their, their budget and their money and I think we do need we do need a better program for longer term strategy with 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 um a budget that goes alongside that over a longer term you know and I think it would help prevent some of that anxiety as it comes up to those cliff edge times because it it may not be anxiety in the people who are receiving the mitigations but it's anxiety within our sector because people who receive the mitigations don't even know they're getting them so um you know they they're potentially come april going to be with hype no why and not realize that that they were actually um receiving the mitigations of which you know obviously um are brilliant it is good that our executive can work together and step in on those things um but i guess it i suppose i don't know whether it's what you were trying you were rachel that if our executive could speak with the one voice to Westminster about the challenges that the people from here face with the data that backs that up, I mean, I mean, we are both super passionate about evidence-based policymaking, which so rarely happens here. Um, you know, that you can go with a collective voice um, and, and speak on our behalf, you know, um, that obviously would be beneficial, you know. I um, think Louise, it might be miracles you're looking for. I think Carl, yeah, I'm looking all about the miracles. <laughs> Honestly, I do believe our Good Friday Agreement was miraculous, uh, and the longer we are, the further we are from it, uh, the more miraculous it seems to me sometimes. But look, it can be done. I, I you know, I, I do feel that it, that you know these things can happen if there's enough will to make them happen. Oh, absolutely. I, I don't disagree. I think, though, we do see, we've seen it even this week, how frustrating it is, you know, from those of us who, who do speak with a progressive voice and are trying to bring populations with us and and achieve change and bring people over the line. And there's no recognition of that. So it, it can be incredibly frustrating. Carl, are yeah. you looking in there? Sorry, at the, at the end of the day, um, not get disagreement um but the, but the issue is before the three years of a hiatus there was another year of negotiating and only we got the welfare mitigations in the place that have been down around its knees and there's nothing to say there's absolutely nothing to say that for example um you're right about the budgeting um i mean this is the british government who decided to give us an annual budget as part of the NDNA, despite them saying we need multi-annual budgets. So it's not that if um, anybody who isn't frustrated with that. And then the other thing around the whole equality impact assessment stuff that just mentioned, uh, for me, it needs more prominence as a government because the only, only department to do it has been communities. Yeah. So they've done yeah. a fully at the very, very start and provided the evidence base and it's not happening elsewhere. So, I mean, the Bill of Rights isn't going to fix all that. It's not going to fix attitudes. It's legislation to fix attitudes. So yeah. maybe that's what it needs to be because all this discussion, while it's interesting as it's been, in absence of any legislation, it's going nowhere because I know for, for a fact you don't change people, you change your opportunities. And the only way you can change your opportunities is through strong legislation to protect the rights. Shanae. Yeah. yeah, I think we agree. We totally agree that that certainly for, for women, we need the legislation um, and at an individual level that people can actually utilise the legislation to support their rights. Yeah, we agree. And I... You know, even I, I share a lot of the frustrations around the, the single year budget compared to multi year. I had a meeting actually with the finance minister earlier today where we talked about this. But I think there are many things that are incredibly frustrating that are handed down to us that we have no control over. And, and one option I think our executive really should be doing and, and has done in some examples is, well, if we can't change that part of the legislation, how can we do better elsewhere? So it'll lessen the impact. Um, and that's where I think we need to be looking at things around how our social security is delivered and, and really listening to the voluntary and community sector on these issues. And just to give you the examples as well, like COVID funding, um, COVID funding, the way a lot of the COVID funding support was rolled out, 
we did really well in some areas. So like a free school meals, we were able to avoid the disaster that they had in GB over that. But then equally, if you look at things like, um, you know, additional money that needs to be sent out, let's get people vouchers. You know, we should be giving people a day to spend money how they know their own families do need it and, and hand the money directly to them. And I just think there are always going to be blocks where we can't change it um, because the decision is being made elsewhere. And I think our executive really could utilize de devolution a lot more to improve the areas where we can then to lessen the impact of the decisions that we haven't necessarily made ourselves. I think that's everyone, unless anybody else. I'm not sure if Christopher has joined us yet, but I don't see any other indications. Eric, no, you'll get me right. Okay, I think that's it. Everyone has frozen. So um, thank you very much, Rachel and Louise. I don't know if you're both still there. Yeah, still here. Yeah. Oh, you're moving. Sorry. Thanks very much for joining us this afternoon and uh, for your contribution. So we'll, we'll let you get on now and enjoy the rest of your day. And thank you. All the members back. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time and, and the opportunity. And, and we, we, I suppose, recommit to... Um, Support me, whatever support you feel you need from the from the women's policy group. Brilliant. Thank you. To echo that, thank you so much for having us here. And you know, the women's policy group is incredibly broad with a, a large number of experts on different areas. So we would be really committed to working with you further on this. But thank you for the opportunity today. And I hope you're all rallied up like we are after we go uh, <laughs> answering these questions. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, we now have our third and final presentation for the day. So, Clerk, if we can bring Ektu up into the spotlight. Oh, my goodness, Ektu. I don't see any movement. Nothing's happening here. Clerk, can we... We get, we're having some time. Sorry, Claire. Yes, if uh, John, Patrick, Claire, and Patricia, just to come into the spotlight as well, we'll just wait for broadcasting to bring them in. Brilliant. That's them. Claire, here, yeah. Hi. Hi, Chair. Can you hear me now? Claire, yes, I can I can hear you and welcome you very much to the Great. meeting this afternoon. Um, just, just to let members know we're this is our third briefing this afternoon so we've got Patricia McKeown, John Patrick Clayton and Claire Moore from from the Irish Congress of Trade Unions mm -hmm. to give us a briefing and they've provided um, a short presentation which you would have received in your table papers on Tuesday. Chair thanks very much um, I'm going to kick off um, Claire Moore from the Irish Congress of Trade Unions and thanks for the welcome can I apologise? Um, I never thought I'd hear myself apologising on behalf of my internet connection, but um, that's what I have to do this afternoon. And that's why I think you can't see me, but I am here. Um, I can I'm relate. To, I can relate. Um, yes, absolutely. I'm going to um, just kick off with a short introductory um, remarks, Chair, and then I'm going to hand over to John Patrick and Patricia. So I'm just going to fire on in. Um, and actually, just before I say that, um, we, we've been listening to the evidence all afternoon and um, have been really inspired by it as well. In case I forget to say later on, Congress and our affiliated uh, unions are also members of the Women's Policy Group and contribute to the work um, that that group has done. Um, so just to say that at the outset. Um, so on behalf of Congress, I want to thank the committee for inviting us to provide evidence. Um, and as I said, um, John Patrick Clayton and Patricia McKeown are with me here this afternoon, both of whom are members of the Northern Ireland Committee of the Irish Congress of Trade Unions. Um, John Patrick will touch on issues relating to Brexit and human rights. And Patricia will um, touch on socioeconomic rights once I've finished. Uh, the ICTU is the trade union federation on the island of Ireland, representing approximately 750,000 workers, 200,000 of whom live and work in Northern Ireland. 
our affiliated unions cross public and private sectors and a wide range of workplaces. Women are currently over 50% of our membership and our membership come from all political and religious backgrounds and none and all racial backgrounds. Over the past 23 years, the trade union movement support for the full implementation of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, including the Bill of Rights, has been unwavering. In 1998, we campaigned in support of the agreement and the vast majority of our members voted in favour of the agreement. And subsequently, Congress played a full and constructive role in the Bill of Rights Forum. Indeed, Patricia was one of our two representatives on the forum and we chaired the largest working group on social and economic rights. And since then, the delivery of the Bill of Rights has been a core objective of the trade union movement and has been endorsed by delegates at every conference since then. Congress is also a full member of the Civil Civic Society umbrella organisations, the Equality Coalition and the Human Rights Consortium. And in these capacities, we have campaigned with our partners to make the Belfast Good Friday Agreement commitments on equality and human rights a reality. Our campaign for a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland is also supported by the trade union federations and allies across the UK, the EU and internationally. A Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland is no less relevant today as it was 23 years ago. Indeed, with the realisation of Brexit, attacks on the Human Rights Act and workers' rights by an aggressive Conservative government, not to mention the multiple issues arising from the COVID pandemic, it is more important than ever. I'm now going to hand over to John Patrick first and uh, finally Patricia. Thanks, Claire. Um, hopefully, members and, and Chair, you can hear me OK. I'm John Patrick Clayton. Um, I'm a member of the Northern Ireland Committee. I'll back to you, as, as Claire has already uh, outlined, and I'm just going to very briefly uh, go into two issues which are within the briefing paper um, you should have already received, and that is in relation to the impact of uh, Brexit on workers' rights and some of the concerns and issues we would suggest um, this committee might want to deliberate around that. And then also, um, as other presentations have already touched on today, the, the current review of the Human Rights Act uh, 1998 that's been undertaken, um, that's, been, that's been sought by the UK government. In relation to Brexit and workers' rights, um, other presentations have touched on this today, so I'll, I'll keep this fairly brief. You'll appreciate that for Congress, the protection of workers' rights was, was a key issue whenever the uh, EU exit referendum was called in 2016. Protecting workers' rights was one of the reasons why Congress called for a vote to remain, because EU law has long underpinned a, a range of key employment and discrimination laws. There are some commitments within the Northern Ireland Protocol um, in Article 2 and within the uh, EU-UK Trade and Cooperation Agreement um, in relation to the protection of rights. They are fairly limited um, with regard to workers' rights. Um, the non demunition commitment is, is somewhat limited in that regard. The, the TCA, the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, does not commit fully to level playing field provisions, um, and it's fairly weak with regards to that and there's no commitment to what we would have sought which was dynamic alignment between the EU and UK over time so we are concerned there's the potential that the rights of workers uh, could be eroded over time and inevitably there'll be divergence between uh, the standards that apply within the European Union and the standards that apply um, in, in the UK including Northern Ireland. Now we are in a, a unique position in the UK in that uh, powers around employment laws and equality laws are devolved to the Assembly and we've been working to ensure there's no clawback of those powers from Westminster um, in this regard. Uh, and the Bill of Rights process provides an opportunity to retain and protect rights derived from EU law and prevent those rights being weakened or eroded in the future. I'll just briefly touch on the review of the Human Rights Act 1998 because I appreciate you, you've already received presentations on that and, and no Uh, that this review has been initiated, given that the long-standing policy of the Conservatives has been to replace or amend the Act 
um, the incorporation of the Convention on Human Rights into Northern Ireland law uh, was a core provision in our view of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. It's currently provided for via the Human Rights Act. And so we're obviously concerned that the agreement could be contravened if the Human Rights Act was weakened. It also has the potential, we, we fear, to cut across the work that this committee is doing because this committee is considering how to enhance our rights framework and how to supplement the ECHR. And we would really urge you to see the ECHR as the minimum human rights framework that should apply in Northern Ireland, um, as, as others have already alluded to through the course of their presentation. So I'm going to hand over to Patricia, who's just going to say a piece a little bit on economic and social rights and conclude. Okay. Uh, thank you, Claire and John Patrick. <clears throat> in our written submission, we've we, we've set out our, our rationale um, and our action plan over many decades. Uh, I'll go back first to the um, the Bill of Rights Forum. Um, we've engaged for many decades with the political systems on the need for a Bill of Rights, but more recently, 20 years of engagement with political structures to this end. Um, however, our most intensive collective agreement with the collective political parties here was in the Bill of Rights Forum, disturbingly, over 13 years ago. As Claire has mentioned, the largest subgroup chaired by Congress was the Social and Economic Rights Group. In the course of that engagement, we all had the opportunity to explore a more in-depth understanding, particularly on the difference between absolute rights and progressive realisation of rights, and the significance of the tool of objective need in that realisation. We also argued, and still do, that a Bill of Rights can reinforce the hand of the executive in resource negotiations with the UK government. Uh, again, an important facet of our work already mentioned by Claire, uh, we are full members of the wider civil society organisations, the Human Rights Consortium, the Equality Coalition, and consequently we fully support the submissions already made by both organisations to this committee and the Make Our Future Fair campaign, uh, currently being led by the Consortium to Deliver a Bill of Rights. And of course, as she has said, we fully support the submission made today by the Women's Policy Group, of which we too are members. Aside from wide ranging support for trade, from trade union centres on the islands and internationally, we also have political support for a Bill of Rights from the EU and from the US. And we note yesterday the bipartisan support from the US Senate on the peace agreement and its reaffirmed support for the Bill of Rights alongside continuing support from President Biden. We also recognise that the landscape within which this committee is now examining the creation of a Bill of Rights is different from that which existed at the time of the peace agreement. Um, however, it remains our strong view that the Bill of Rights should be legis legislated for via the UK Parliament at Westminster in line with the intention of the agreement. COVID has confirmed the inequality in our society and continues, it continues to um, compound that inequality. It has major social and economic impact on workers, their families, their communities across Northern Ireland. It has disproportionately impacted on women and the poorest and most deprived communities. Once again, highlighting the economic inequalities that have affected Northern Ireland for many years. High levels of confirmed redundancies have already occurred and the economic inactivity rate has increased, I think, to its highest level, uh, as has demand for working age benefits. Congress fears that this situation will only grow worse as the furlough scheme and other mit mitigations come to an end. And there's a growing body of international evidence supporting the fact that job creation alone does not challenge poverty. It must be tied to rights. So the big issue facing progressive governments and civil society is how to move out of the pandemic to a fairer social and economic model. How to do it? While radical interventions that seemed unthinkable a year ago have been made to mitigate against the shock of COVID. We say that there can be no going back to the economic and social conditions that existed in Northern Ireland pre-COVID and which are now worsening. Congress has issued detailed proposals on the measures required in terms of health, social care, social protection, education, housing, poverty, the rights of workers, taxation and public spending 
to ensure a new deal for our society as we em emerge from COVID-19. International bodies such as the UN Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights have called for states to make substantial investments in the institutions and programmes necessary for the realisation of economic, social and cultural rights to ensure that the world's a better place and is better prepared for future pandemics and disasters. So in addition to supporting the submission uh, to this committee by the Equality Coalition, we're also referencing the research commissioned by the Human Rights Consortium from the Human Rights Centre at Queen's, which explores different models of enforceability for socio-economic rights. It notes that such rights were included within the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission advice to the UK government back in 2008, and that currently there's a very patchy approach to the protection of such rights in Northern Ireland that falls far short of the requirements of international standards. We need political will. We most recently have the announcement of the economic recovery plan from one minister and the development of long-awaited equality strategies from another. Within a Bill of Rights framework, the merging of both is capable of producing the type of recovery and resilience plan essential to create a fairer society here. As society seeks to recover from the impact of the pandemic, a strong equality and human rights framework should underpin key policy decisions being made by government. We believe that this would help the devolved institutions acting as both a benchmark and a safeguard in the exercise of executive and legislative powers and as leverage in negotiations with the UK government and Treasury. A strong focus on social and economic rights within the Bill of Rights can assist greatly in a fair recovery that addresses inequality within our society. In conclusion... ICT2 welcomes the renewed focus on the Bill of Rights that the Ad Hoc Committee has brought. Whilst we recognise the importance of gathering evidence from stakeholders in civil society, we would point out that there's a huge body of evidence from civil society over two decades, which richly indicates the collective unwavering commitment that exists for the delivery of a rights-based society. Today, a Bill of Rights has become even more relevant between the impact of COVID and Brexit and disturbing signals from the UK government on human rights and workers' rights. Um, it is now important that we uh, seize the opportunity to get a Bill of Rights in place now. And I really would urge the committee to take on board what we're saying, but also that vast amount of information and evidence base that comes from the rest of civil society. Thank you. Thank you very much to you all. Um, that, that was useful, as was the written presentation that you provided. I know that you've touched on this in terms of worker, workers' rights and other presenters, as you've outlined, have also made reference to it this afternoon. But I just wondered if we would, could, because when we're talking about a Bill of Rights and obviously the change in even in the particular circumstances in the North in the 23 years that have passed since the signing of the Good Friday Agreement, Brexit obviously has focused the minds for a lot of people because of the rights that, you know, people took from being a part of the EU and then took for granted. And I think it was Louise Coyle that had said earlier, you know, people don't realise that some of the things that they have that they now have, have come to be familiar with are potentially going to be under threat. So the impact of Brexit and that review of the HRA, I would be interested to know if you would give some more detail on, on what your concerns are there specifically. John Patrick, do you want to come in on that? Sure. Um, I can I can open up and maybe others maybe others can contribute as well. I, I think, Chair, the, the concern we have immediately is as you've said yourself, EU law really provided the framework around workers' rights for many, many years. And straight away, I mean, I I've I've heard others kind of compare it to it being a bit like the Jenga Tower. If there are anyone who's familiar familiar with the game. You know, you've, you've got sort of a series of building blocks and what Brexit has done is it started to pull at some of those building blocks a little bit and it stabilizes the entire legal framework. Um, as we've outlined in our paper, there's, there's two major issues we can see. Firstly, outside of the EU framework, it would be easier to erode or weaken workers' rights over a period of time. It may not happen immediately, it may not happen overnight but the potential threat and, and risk to workers' rights increases. 
And, and secondly, there's the problem of divergence over time. And we've, we've given some examples in our paper um, of directives that are being brought forward at the European level. And there are others that are under discussion at the moment as well in the European level, at the European level that will eventually move into the domestic legal systems of, of the member states, um, but won't apply in Northern Ireland um, because there isn't that provision within the trade and cooperation agreement for uh, dynamic alignment on these sorts of issues. So that that, that is a concern. Um, the trade and cooperation agreement itself doesn't provide, it's, it's fairly weak, I would say, on the level playing field. It, it effectively provides that um, the provisions around the level playing field are not to lower the current levels of protections to the extent that any reduction may affect trade or investment. And the concern there, I think, is that last piece it has to be shown that any reduction would affect trade or investment. So immediately that's a bit of a warning sign to ourselves and that if there was a reduction in protections in order to show that it was breaching the terms of the Trade and Cooperation Act, you'd have to show that. And that may be very, very complicated and very, very difficult to do. I suppose to bring it back to the, the, the point I, I made earlier, Northern Ireland has the potential because the, the powers around employment laws and equality laws are devolved to Northern Ireland. It has the potential and we very much hope that the executive will to enhance workers' rights over time. And that's been used in the past. I mean, in the past, Northern Ireland has not followed uh, UK government provisions. And, and Patricia can speak to this more, more knowledgeably than, than myself. She was more intimately involved, but had, has not followed UK government uh, plans around trade union rights, for example. We've avoided those over the last decade and, and more. Um, and there is the potential for us to continue to do that. But we do think the Bill of Rights really gives the opportunity to entrench workers' rights, uh, to really set a very strong framework there that will be very difficult to deviate from moving into the future and might help to mitigate the impact that withdrawing from the EU has, has had. Um, Patricia or, or Claire, would you like to comment a little bit on, on that point? So Claire, do you want to come in on the current directives that give us cause for concern? Yes, Patricia, I was just I was just going to do that. Um, thanks for that. Yeah, we, we gave a couple of examples in the briefing paper that we provided. Um, and I think uh, John Patrick alluded to um, the the issue of keeping pace. Our concern, as he has said, is that that doesn't um, obviously cover um, upcoming directives. So, for example, um, the um, Ursula von der Leyen has recently announced um, the development of the Gender um, Pay Transparency Directive. Um, it's a, an incredibly important um, directive, an incredibly important issue. We've just listened for nearly, I suppose, nearly two hours or an hour and a half anyway, to the Women's Policy Group uh, um, outline um, uh, inequalities facing women in Northern Ireland. And um, if we look at the gender pay gap, um, the gender pay gap in Northern Ireland still exists. Um, women are um, uh, still um, impacted in relation to um, low pay and gender pay. And yet um, one of the most important directives, progressive equality directives, that is going to be coming out of the EU in many years, a gender pay transparency directive is not going to apply. So that gives us grave concern. Um, and I think John Patrick's right as well that um, the, um, the fact that employment rights um, are devolved in the Northern Ireland Assembly um, um, uh, means that Congress is um, working um, very hard to, um, to make sure that those devolved powers are used to maximum effect. We only have to look, for example, at the commitments made in New Decade, New Approach on protecting workers' rights and enhancing employment laws, including commitments, for example, to ban and zero hour contracts. So I think those are a, a number of brief comments, Patricia, that, um, that, that might, you might want to pick up on. Uh, a unique feature of devolution for us, as, as uh, has already been mentioned, is the devolution of employment rights and trade union rights. Um, and that has led to also uh, um, a unique development here in that the Congress and the employers' organisation some years ago uh, formed a roundtable 
uh, which is convened under the auspices of the Labour Relations Agency. And uh, we collectively agreed uh, to lobby our own government here uh, at the time the Conservative government was um, making um, proposals and in fact subsequently did um, eat into um, some of the laws on employment rights, workers' rights and trade union rights. Uh, and there was a joint agreement from, if you like, both sides of business industry here um, that we did not want that to happen because we, we believe we have uh, a more favourable uh, working relationship um, from the shop floor upwards. Uh, but there is much, much yet to be done. So I don't believe that the um, Assembly or the Executive have yet taken the opportunity um, to do something more positive with those devolved powers. Uh, a Bill of Rights uh, framework um, would allow advancement of them. Um, would enable us to start uh, making ground on uh, what you heard today from the Equality Commission uh, and from the Women's Policy Group, um, make make up the ground and in fact develop uh, beyond where we are now uh, and where others are um, on that deficit on um, employment equality rights and other rights. Um, when the peace agreement came into operation and the 98 Act went through, Northern Ireland was in the unique position on these islands of being more advanced on equality and human rights than anybody else, not the Republic, not, not England, not Scotland, not Wales. Um, 23 years later, um, we are in the terrible disadvantaged position of being far more than a decade behind. So there is much work to be done. A Bill of Rights framework would enable that, we believe, to advance much more quickly. It will also, I think, support the executive as it tries to work out um, how you do operate the protocol, um, how, how you do ensure that there's going to be um, consistency um, with, the, with the rights that are agreed at a European level but do no longer automatically apply here. And I think a Bill of Rights would be a very good mechanism for ensuring that it is easier for the executive to cope with those issues. Thank you to you all. I'm going to pass now to Mike, the Vice Chair. Sorry, my microphone takes a while to kick in, but uh, Patricia, Claire and John Patrick, thank you very much for, for your engagement. Um, I think some of my issues are at least half covered. But can we go back to this, the, the upcoming pay transparency directive? What exactly is it intended to achieve? Is that you coming in, Claire, or me? Is that Claire? Can, can we hear you? Maybe lost Claire temporarily there. I think Claire. No, I'm not hearing Claire. We can hear you, Patricia. If you can, you take it. It's 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 building it's building uh, on the um. Uh, still don't come here. Um, which is the the directive on um, monitoring the gender pay gap. And it's building on that. It's, it's really digging into, again, beneath that, and digging into real pay transparency because you can look at organisations and you first on what the gap looks like, but you've got to really dig them deep into um, what pay really looks like. And the transparency of pay is also linked to um, rights around collective bargaining as well. Now, while we have... Uh, collective bargaining in um, main areas here in Northern Ireland um, have gotten uh, very strongly in the public sector and we have them in tracts of um, private sector, usually the bigger enterprises. Um, we do not have collective bargaining in a, a wide range of employments where there is um, actually hostility to trade union organisations. So, you know, um, this kind of a directive starts to develop the relationship that's necessary between workers and their representatives and the employers and to really look at what we mean by uh, equal pay, by uh, pay for work of equal value, 
um, that we don't have situations where um, pay and pay board is conducted in secret apart from everybody else, very often inside the same enterprise. So Sorry, I got knocked out there. <laughs> I got knocked out there. Um, apologies for that, but um, ju just to um, echo and endorse what Patricia has said. Um, I mean, the, uh, one of the things that certainly um, the European TUC is um, is going to be lobbying very hard for in relation to this um, gender pay transparency directive is that it will end pay secrecy. So, for example, banning secrecy clauses in contracts so that um, workers can actually discuss pay. Um, for example, um, uh, as Patricia has just said, supporting unions to negotiate with employers to tackle the pay gap, requiring um, job advertisements to include um, a pay scale and um, preventing employers hiding behind um, uh, privacy data protection, uh, or um, you know, saying that administrative burden um, requires that they they can't disclose pay transparency. So those are some of the measures um, that we hope will be included in the new directive. Okay, so so it's basically about making sure that the that the right data is available to you to take enforcement action rather than enforcement action per se. Well, I don't think it's even necessarily uh, initially seen as enforcement uh, action. It's seen as um, it is seen as a collective bargaining issue because um, there's a belief it won't guarantee pay uh, equality, um, but it is believed that as pay becomes transparent and the facility to discuss pay is something that's properly made available, that it will start to narrow the gender pay gap. Okay, uh, but Patricia, what, what about gender uh, budgeting? How, how is the ICTU in that? And uh, do you think there's a role for the for a Bill of Rights to play? Well, um, we fully support, uh, as I've said, as members of the Women's Policy Group, we fully support the um, move or the proposal that we're making for a, a, a gender budgeting as a tool for the Northern Ireland Executive, and we put that in our recent Congress submission um, on the draft Northern Ireland budget. Um, I still have affiliates like my own union have also echoed the same thing. Um, we, would, we would say that give yourselves a break. <laughs> if you had a Bill of Rights, uh, if you had a Bill of Rights and an equality of uh, framework, within which to deal with these issues, then you would you would be removing some of the tensions, the, the party political tensions that exist that can block. Um, you would be you would be fulfilling the obligations set out in, in the in the agreement, the peace agreement. Um, you'd also be doing a very, very good service for civil society here. You know, that I was shocked all those 13 years ago at the resistance um, from uh, some political parties in particular to the concept of social and economic rights. And the argument that in somehow um, the Bill of Rights would rob politicians of their right to make those decisions, it doesn't impinge on those rights at all, but it does make for uh, a fairer and more balanced overall approach. Uh, and then a much more targeted um, way of dealing with the, the policies that you subsequently agree to. Uh, in a society that, as you know, is in dire, dire trouble. I mean, the fact that we have more than 26% of our population currently classed as economic, in, in, economically alive is the road to nowhere. Okay. Thank you, Patricia. And uh, I'll, I'll leave yeah, it there. Oh. Sorry, um, just very briefly, just for the, just so it's on the record, just to say that Congress is also a, a very active member of the Northern Ireland Women's Budget Group, um, and uh, we play a key role in that group as well. So just, okay. just to say that. Thanks, Claire. Appreciate it. That's me, Chair.
No problem, Mike. Carol is the only other person that I have that has indicated. So, Carol, if you um, want. See anybody that's not talking, could just put yourselves on mute because I were hearing aids and it's not, it's been like a, it's like going to a thrash metal concert here. <laughs> the sounds all over the place. Um, so, listen, uh, just thank us for your presentation. There's a lot of um, similarities between previous presentations and obviously, you know, these are, these are all um, involved in various groups, so that's no surprise. Um, and I just think that, I mean, the comments that just, that just have opened with are reassuring for me. I wouldn't expect any different anyway. That you also share the concerns around the so-called review of the Human Rights Act. And given the fact that we don't have a single Equality Act is just really, really concerning. Um, so I suppose, you know, I mean, the question I would have is, that in relation to any discussions you have had um, regarding the Westminster introducing a Bill of Rights, um, I appreciate it's been 23 years from the Good Friday Agreement and some of us are still here, um, but progress here is a lot slower and it's a lot slower because people want to deny rights. So that's basically the context for it all, but just wondering what discussions you have had um, with the, the, both the British and Irish government around the Bill of Rights? Well, we've had 20-odd um, <clears throat> years of discussions with subsequent um, UK governments of all persuasions, uh, Labour, uh, uh, Tory, um, coalition. <laughs> uh, and while th those are always very civil engagements and, you know, commitments are made and promises are made, they're not delivered. And that's why we do not have a Bill of Rights today. And a fairly consistent argument the whole way through uh, was that um, because there was no political consensus in Northern Ireland for a Bill of Rights, uh, they couldn't move forward. And we would consistently argue with them that we were one of the organisations that pushed for the right to produce a Bill of Rights to be vested in Westminster precisely because there wouldn't be political agreement in Northern Ireland. So we have time and time again over those 20 odd years said, look, um, our approach to it was very similar to the uh, your approach to Patton. You know, you took responsibility, you came up with the um, solutions and you said this is the way it's going to be. We're asking you to do the same thing with the Bill of Rights. But the truth of the matter is um, there have been various attempts to sideline this and to bury it in, for example, a proposal emerged at one stage for a UK Bill of Rights. Now, that commission came here. Uh, we gave evidence to the UK commission. Uh, and when I say we, I am talking about all of the um, organisations that you're hearing from in civil society um, under the auspices of the uh, Human Rights Consortium. Uh, and we also had very serious community representation in that process. And that included from some of the most disadvantaged Republican and loyalist communities, all speaking with one voice, all saying we need a Bill of Rights, all particularly emphasising social and economic rights. Um, and the conclusion of that commission, after all its two years of work or whatever, was um, that they weren't going to proceed with a UK Bill of Rights, but there should be a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland. But still, we didn't get one. So we are fed up, but this is a new era, a very difficult time that everybody's facing, and we're under no illusions about the pressures that the executive is facing at this point in time. There are things you need to do. There are things we want you to do. You do not necessarily have the resources to do it. We have um, made some proposals about how those resources might be um, secured, in particular from the UK government. Um, but we would also argue that um, one of the very serious tools in your armour ought to be a Bill of Rights to increase your negotiating leverage because it is a part of the peace agreement. The UK government and the Irish government are guarantors of that agreement and therefore... They should listen to what you have to say about the resources necessary to start turning around a very bad situation in this society of ours. Just, if I might, Patricia, just, just um, to mm. add a, a little bit to that. Um, one of the things we've been keen to do um, is to 
reintroduce the Bill of Rights uh, in, in the US whenever we've engaged with um, labor leaders in the US and political leaders in the US over the last number of years, particularly because of the impacts we could see Brexit having and the concerns we had around the stability of the Human Rights Act going forwards. Um, we also have worked uh, with the Labour Party in relation to um, moving it higher up their political agenda and the last Labour Party uh, manifesto for the general election in 2019, if I'm getting my years right, um, contained a commitment in relation to the Bill of Rights. So there has been some work done on, on, on that front. I think one, one thing that uh, I think could be worthwhile for the committee, as I'm sure you already have done, is revisiting the Commission's 2008 advice to the Secretary of State on this very issue, because I, I used the word entrenchment earlier. Um, and I think the Commission's advice is, is quite important in, in, that, in that regard as to why there is an importance of having Westminster legislate for this, even in legal terms, in that um, the, the, the strength of the Bill of Rights um, would be would be considerably enhanced and that, on that basis. And also there's the issue of those public authorities that would be um, captured, if I can put it that way, by a Bill of Rights that was legislated for at Westminster level. But we don't underestimate the political challenges that are there. And, and indeed, I think as, as a Congress and as individual affiliate unions and working with civic society, we've been trying to build political support for the Bill of Rights for that very reason. Mm. Carol, is that you? Yeah, thank you, yeah. guys. Thank you very much. Nora Maggot. I don't see any other members indicating. So I think at this point we can... And I'm just holding out in case anyone is. Um, but Patricia, John, Patrick and Claire, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon and for your contribution. And I'll let you drop off now and enjoy the rest of your day. Brilliant. So, Clerk, can we get the other members back into the spotlight? Happy days. Okay, so we've still got five. So we've had our um, presentations there. So we can now move on to chairperson's business and we don't have any this afternoon. Um, item number six in our agenda is our draft minutes. And you'll find the draft minutes uh, for our last meeting at page 114 of the pack. Are members content to agree those? Yep. Number seven, matters arising. Do we have any matters arising? Yeah, Chair, yeah. Can, I, can I bring up the forward work programme and specifically this idea of, I know there's a question mark on it in the forward work programme at the moment, but the idea of having a debate in, in June. I mean, just, I'm very conscious we've, we've spent basically all our time taking evidence, uh, which is quite right, the best way to start. We haven't yet sat down as, as a group to see where we are in terms of collective thinking. And, and also bearing in mind what Monica McWilliams said last week, and bearing in mind Monica was the chief commissioner in 2008 when the advice was presented and rejected. I just, I just, I see potentially more downsides and upsides in going straight to a debate. I mean, I know from my point of view, I'm going to have to do a significant amount of work within, within my party to, to bring them with me. And I haven't, you know, to be honest, I haven't had a discussion with them yet because we're at the point where we're still gathering our evidence. So I'm just wondering, should, should we knock that back to post-summer recess? Um, Mike, I know Michelle had raised this before. The chair had said to me today that this was likely to come up, but that because it is quite a formal agreement and it requires basically the rescinding of a decision that was made in an earlier time and making a new decision, that we can't formally decide today, but we can put it on the agenda to discuss it next week. The, the, the mechanism for these committees. So we can then discuss this next week and, and make a decision on it then. Are people yeah, I'm just fearful that if we go for a debate, somebody, and not necessarily a member of this committee, is going to stand up and say something that is divisive. And so far, we've had no division. 
Um, you know, I think we're, my impression is we're working well as a, as a group of seven. So, yeah, okay, I'm happy, happy to discuss it next week. And just, just to emphasize, I'm not against having a debate. I'm just nervous that the first time we go public, something goes wrong. And, yes, and sir. I need time to, to do groundwork with, with others. Yeah, no, fair enough. So, so we can, can we put that then on the Clara for next week and we will clear, can we do that next week? Is that okay? And then at that point, we can make the decision. Sure. Right. No, sir. Oh, that's right, Chair. Yes, next week we'll put it into matters arising and then a uh, formal decision can be made. Good stuff. Okay, members, um, the next item then is our correspondence and you'll find the correspondence uh, from page 119 of the meeting pack. Is everyone okay to uh, agree that or note the correspondence? I see heads nodding. And then number uh, nine is our forward work program and we've obviously had that conversation around that so we'll have that discussion in greater detail next week so that brings me on to any other business does any other member have anything they want to raise no brilliant we can conclude then and announce the date time and place of our next meeting as again the same time the same place next thursday in all of our own homes and offices Let's thank you, go you. Then. thank you jake first thanks yeah. You too. Yeah. Here's everybody.